This Week in Virology, the podcast about viruses, the kind that make you sick. This Week in Virology, episode number 357, recorded on October 2nd, 2015. Hi everybody, I'm Vincent Racaniello, and you are listening to TWIV the podcast all about viruses. Joining me here in the studio, Dixon de Pommier. Hello, Vincent. I was about to say, in a rainy New York City. It's true. Rainy, windy, and 11 degrees Celsius, cloudy, yep. Yep. as a consequence of a nor'easter, right? Yes, but thank goodness it's raining because we haven't had any in a long time. Yeah, we did need the rain. <clears throat> we still do. And we will. <clears throat> yeah, unavoidably. Uh, does your throat need water? Um, not water, it just needs clearing. Uh, if you take the subway downtown 20 <laughs> blocks, you can get a glass of water. Okay? Yeah, that's true. That's true. Also joining us today from North Central Florida, Rich Condit. Hi, everybody. How you doing? Rich. I bet you still have uh, bad weather down there, right? You're on the yeah, East Coast. Yeah, it's not great. It's been overcast ever since I've been home. Actually, you're not and on the East Coast, but uh, you're an East Coast <laughs> state, right? Yeah. So, I yeah, I don't know that this has anything to do with the hurricane, because that, that missed us by... Uh, a long shot but it's been ever since i've been back it's been overcast which is a drag and it's been very humid which is a drag it's not all that hot today it's 75 degrees 24 c but it's uh like 90 percent humidity and overcast and so hmm. that's a drag but you know i can't complain i will but i can't look at this big i'm looking at a weather map and we yeah. have this big green blob that's right yeah, there's there's a little green over Gainesville, but most of the rest of Florida is clear, Rich. Right. Nothing over Michigan, which is uh, in the north southeastern part of that state. <laughs> that's where we would find Kathy Spindler. Hi, everybody. Hello, Kathy. Uh, you have nice weather, right? We do. It is 58 Fahrenheit, 14 Celsius, and partly sunny, partly cloudy. Cool. You know, on this weather map, um, all the states are labeled except Michigan. <laughs> now, why is that? I don't know. What weather map are you looking at? Well, I have an app on my phone. It's called Weather, and you can click on the bottom and get a weather map. And, uh, hmm. you know, all the states are labeled by yours. So It's probably so widely known that they don't I have, want to. <laughs> I have two apps on my phone that are called Weather. Yeah, it's a really unique name, isn't it? It's not. Weather app. <laughs> also joining us today from Western Massachusetts, Alan Dove. Good to be here. It's you, uh, you must about have the same, same about the same as what you have. It's yeah. drizzly and blustery. It's ah. blowing about uh, ten gusting to nineteen knots, I think they say, and uh, going to stay like that for a while. Yep. I was up your way this morning, and yesterday I was in Boston. Ah, which is not really close to you, right? Oh, it's two scrot? hours. <laughs> it's scrot. <laughs> <laughs> um, it was just like the weather here. Yeah, it was windy and not so rainy yet. When I left, it right. hadn't yet started to rain, but the, the flight was very bumpy because you don't go up very high. Oh, right, sixteen thousand feet. That's that's hardly even worth flying. And they keep the, the f they keep the speed pretty low, so they don't get there in a second, right? Right. 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 They do two hundred and forty knots. Now, what what is that, Alan? Uh, well, multiply by 1.1 to get miles per hour. It's not as um, fast as they can go, right? Oh, well, it Lord depends. Knows. Were you in a jet or a turboprop? Yeah, I was in a um, some kind of Airbus jet. Yeah, I don't know what it yeah, was. they can they can go much higher and faster than that. Certainly, so, so they purposely go slow so they otherwise the traffic gets all um, crazy. Yeah, fuel. it's probably probably for traffic reasons. And um, jets are are really really inefficient at low altitudes. Yeah. So it's actually it's a terrible route to have a jet flying on um but you know the airlines do stupid stuff sometimes so the slower the slower they go the less efficient they are they well it depends um jets should be uh, for best efficiency a jet should be at high altitude that's right. where they operate best sure um and cruising at you know 450 knots or so so that's what they're built for when you're down at low altitudes they're a lot less efficient and um most of the fuel on a flight like that is going to be spent climbing yeah, anyway. Sure, sure, sure. So, so a turboprop is better at a lower attitude? Tur a turboprop would be much better for a route like that, but the airlines don't do that because people don't like them. 
That's true. Why they're bumpy? Yeah, they're slow. No, they're not bumpy. They just they just have the image of being. People refer to them as puddle jumpers. Yeah. <laughs> Yes. And oh, so yeah. there's the image of, oh, you know, you, your airport only gets turboprop <laughs> service. You must yeah. be out in the sticks. I see. Um, I don't mind them at all. I don't mind them at all. I, I prefer them for short reads like that, but I'm not the majority. All right. We do have a guest today who we are roundly ignoring, but I figure he didn't want to talk <laughs> about airplanes. He is, uh, he's been here before on TWIV. He, uh, let's see if you can guess. This is our only <laughs> guess who has two PhDs. Now think for a minute. Doom, 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 doom. Okay, you got it. It's Jens Kuhn. Welcome back, Jens. <laughs> nice to be back. Jens is, uh, let me get this right, virology lead at NIH, and he wor- actually works for Tunnel Government Services, which is a contractor, right? Correct. So that's your employer. Correct? Yes. But you're, are you physically locally, located on the NIH campus? Yeah, I'm not in the NIH campus. I'm sitting at the Integrated Research Facility at Fort Detrick, which right, is right. basically a satellite campus. Fort Detrick, the Integrated is the BSL-4, basically, right? Correct. Mm-hmm. So you're not too far from dangerous viruses? Uh, no, they're upstairs. Upstairs, wow. Did you hear them uh, being dangerous? Yeah, they, they talk all the time. <laughs> oh, they <laughs> they, they scream, the they scream I think. You know, they yeah, sound they like know. zombies. and <laughs> They so, shriek. <laughs> so we made a... Um, so you were in the New York Times a couple of months ago, your picture. Yeah, it's a little longer ago, but yes. And True. did people start saying hello to you on the street as a consequence? <laughs> no. <laughs> no. They didn't yeah, give no, you free no, no things? Look, mommy, there's a here. famous virologist. <laughs> you didn't get free things at restaurants, no? No, no free things, no groupies. Because no. we said, we'll never get Jens back. He's too famous now. And then shortly afterwards, you wrote and said, I would like to come back, actually, and talk about something that we hinted at last time. So here yeah. you are. Well, I told you, I'm listening to this when I run. Great. Excellent. Do you run a long way? Because so, we're pretty long now. <laughs> well, I'm, I'm not running for two hours, but I, I usually do my 10 miles or so. Oh, How long does it lot. take you? Um, I, it depends. It depends on whether the relaxation runs or whether I go fast. I'm not a fast runner. Mm. So you know, my, my half marathon times are like 145 or something. So not, not very impressive. You run in the morning or in, in the evening? Um, well, I used to run in the evening, um, but now it's getting dark. Yeah. So I, I have a little bit of a problem right now. It's also super rainy right now, and it's messing everything up. Yeah, yeah. yeah you have the same weather we have down there. It's raining, right? Right, 11 degrees centigrade. Blah. <laughs> I'm actually coming to Washington tomorrow. I have a meeting at ASM. Yeah, And then Sunday I'm going to Germany. Oh, good for you. And I'm going to uh, – I always pronounce this wrong. Dixon, where am I going? Leipzig. 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 Mm-hmm. Leipzig. Do you know that city? Of course. You're not from it, right? Where are you from? No, I'm from Nuremberg. So okay. That's in the, that's Nuremberg, in the south. Yes. Got it. Yeah. Leipzig is beautiful. Yeah? Ah. Yep. Okay. So what's happening in Leipzig, uh, Vincent? I'm going to record um, something like 12 lectures on microbiology for a company. Oh, cool. Oh. It's called Lecturio. And they sell Excellent. they sell subscriptions. And you, you know, sort of like... Um, Lynda.com, you buy a monthly subscription, then you can watch all their videos. So they have uh, mostly lectures by professors and docs and various sorts, and they wanted me to do microbiology. So um, they're actually going to pay me. So I figured I could get some cred with my wife because all the other things I do, I don't make any money at. So <laughs> I said, it's usually, like cred when I, or crud. Yeah, right. Usually I say to her, I, I have to go here. <coughs> to do a podcast and she said you're not going to get paid right and and, then i get a lot of grief so this time i said i got invited to germany it's for five days but i'm going to get paid and she said okay it's fine (laughs) good (laughs) and there will be good bread and good beer yeah do they have good beer there they should because uh, oktoberfest is over or is it start it's in the it's in the south anyway it doesn't matter yeah Yeah, but oktoberfest is not well I'm I'm too German to, for this, I guess. I mean, Oktoberfest is a big <laughs> tourist thing. It's a tourist right, thing, yeah. Right, yeah. right, right, right. So it, it, I will find good beer there, right? You will find good beer there. Good beer and good bread. Good my, bread. My right. first uh, professional meeting in Europe was in Munich, and it was during the Oktoberfest. And uh, it was quite interesting to see how many people were sort of unconscious the next morning following... Oh, yeah. <laughs> it's amazing. Completely crazy. Stuff. And you're absolutely right. It's just a tourist thing. But you know, <laughs> how much beer can you drink? You can see, you know, big two liter steins of beer just disappeared. Yeah. I, I asked the, the guy. Uh, I have no tolerance for it at all. 
<laughs> I asked the guy who's my contact. I said, "Is it Oktoberfest?" And he says, "I don't know anything about that. They do that in the South." <laughs> <laughs> okay. So, and Vincent, so I understand you uh, were teaching yourself some mycology. Oh, to yeah. Do these so I'm doing not just virology, which is okay. I can easily do that, right? They want me to do so both introductory and advanced lectures on viruses. Bacteria, Keep going. fungi, yes. and parasites. No, not parasites. All right, Dixon, I'll get things wrong, okay? <laughs> but you've been teaching me. No, you've been doing well. You've been doing So I've well. been reading about um, all these things, and the, fun, the fungus reading I really found very interesting because I knew very little about them. And it's really, fungi are really cool. More people yeah. should work on them. Mm-hmm. And they also have viruses, as everyone knows. It's uh, really neat. We should. You know, there's some people who I know who work on fungal viruses. We should get them on to talk about it sometime. Huh. Yeah, especially because they're weird. <laughs> they're very weird. Yeah, a lot of them not don't the, leave. Not the people, the viruses. The viruses, yes. <laughs> well, the, some of them don't leave the cell. Yeah. All right, so we have a couple of follow ups, follows up. Dixon, can you read the first one from uh, it Jim? It would be my extreme pleasure yeah, I'm to sure read the first one. Uh, Jim writes, uh, "Please be nicer to Dixon." Very short, to the point. I have to, did, Rich Condit lost. We lost him. Let me see. Go. He's not being nice to me. He just dropped off. <laughs> he, just, he said, "Okay, we've got to be nice." To I don't want to be nice to done. Dixon. What? He just left. He just this left. can't work. Oh, here he is. <laughs> I'm back. Did okay. You, did you hear the first follow-up email? Uh, no. All right. I'll read it again. Jim oh, writes. Yes. Please be nicer. Not just nice. Nicer. So it implies that you're already nice. Who do you think he's writing to? Everyone? I have no idea. But read the fortune that we got on a fortune oh. cookie just this afternoon. What do they do with it? Yeah, Dixon went out to lunch. With some other colleagues. He said, the fortune says, to combat a sour attitude, use kind words. <laughs> right. <laughs> All right. So I admit I'm not always nice to you, okay? Uh, and if I know, discuss it any further, I'm going to get mad at you. <laughs> no. <laughs> <what I> <laughs> So and you can tell how that. much of a grudge I hold against now, you. I don't too. want to air our uh, of course not. Our d- disagreements, which we have. And, uh, but uh, we're allowed to because we're human beings. And I'm sorry. I, I will try and be nicer. even if Nicer. It says nicer. It already implies you're nice, so nicer. don't worry about it. Um, but sometimes when you say things that are oh, questionable, yeah, well, I should just say, Dixon, you should check on that instead or, of ranting as or, I do. I know. I know. Well, see, I interpret the use of the word nicer to mean <laughs> you don't actually have to be nice to him. <laughs> uh, well, <laughs> nicer. Kids, this, you're wasting time here. Let's move on. <laughs> but look, obviously, he's bothered by my treatment, so I'll try and do better. Well, Jim you know. is, but nobody else ever wrote that, so yeah. don't worry about it. I bet a lot of so for every person who writes something, there's usually a thousand who are silent on the same issue. Actually, this is my pseudonym. I write in the name of Jim when I write emails to Twiv. <laughs> okay. <laughs> now somebody needs to write in to say no. Be meaner to Dixon. People right. like conflict, don't they? That's what all they these. Do. Uh, no, they do. Right. These uh, these contest Dr. shows. Phil and yeah, it's all about conflict. What's his right? name? You know, that's. Bad. You should start throwing chairs. Yeah. All right, the next one is from Johannes, who writes, Dear Vincent, I heard you mention Kevin Fulta a couple of times on your various podcasts, but you do not seem to be very familiar with his situation, especially when I heard you mention, in passing, Fulta is funded by Monsanto, right, the other week. The two of you are actually not very different. You are both public advocates for science. I therefore think you should make yourself more familiar with his case, especially since you also speak out about the pseudoscience around viruses like vaccines, and HIV denialism in your shows. If the anti-vax crowd were as vicious as the anti-GMO people, they could also target you with FOIA requests, claiming you to be in bed with Big Pharma, and then while reading through thousands of your emails, take and, take and represent some of them out of context. <laughs> Especially the ones to Dixon, right? Exactly. Yes. A good way to start would be to listen to Folta's podcast, episode 13, where he explains what is going on and his alleged ties to Monsanto. He gives a link for that. Otherwise, I love all of your shows. Thanks a lot for the many hours of entertainment you have provided me. All right, so this made me feel really guilty. It does happen. <laughs> well, didn't we actually talk this out? Yeah, this um, came in we after thought that. We did. It came yeah. in after that. Um, so I listened this morning, actually, on the way in. Ah. And it's him. He does this podcast by himself, and he's very appealing. He's got a nice shtick, you know. He's got a good voice, and he's got a good. He, he's joking about this whole situation initially, but then at the end, he's actually crying. He's very upset. So it's very moving what happened to him. 
So what happened was, as we said, actually, he did get $25,000 from Monsanto put into a university account. This is in Gainesville, actually, Rich. I don't know if you know mm. of this fella. Uh, no, I don't know him. And um, this was so he could go and talk various places about teaching scientists how to communicate, talk about transgenic plants and so forth. And, of course, <clears throat> this was picked up by the FOIA request, and he got a lot of crap for it, and he goes through it on this show. And, you know, he got threats to his house, his family, his lab. They published his address online. He's really upset with this. He ends up, the university told him, you have to give this money back, so he's given it back. So I knew this. We all repeated this last time, I understand, and I still say... He should not have taken this money from Monsanto, which is a big maker of plants, right? And seeds right. or whatever, yeah, right, well, Dixon? Well, they yeah, they manipulate them. So if he wants to do this, he should raise money himself. And he does a little bit of that. But uh, I think that was an error. Now, they, w they would have probably found other things to bother him about as well if he didn't take that. But I do think it was a mistake. I would not take, for example, 25 grand from Merck to support TWIV because yeah. Merck makes a lot of different viral vaccines and that would be really not smart to do. However, you could go into my email and find other things, I suppose. Yeah. I did get support from Big Pharma years ago. You could find that and say it's an issue. So um, I'm not saying he was wrong, but probably wasn't the best thing to do. Although I believe he was really excited to have the money and be able to go out and talk about stuff, right? Yeah. But now it got way out of control and... Um, it's too bad. Now, I do appreciate telling me to listen to this because I'm actually going to listen to his podcast because he's going to talk about science most of the time. True. And it, it's interesting. So um, I, I think you know people yeah. should go and listen to him. And, uh, and in, in particular, this episode 13 because he really yeah, bears yeah, yeah. his soul. It's 45 minutes and he gets very upset. And he goes through the whole story of how it happens. So in the end, though, what we said is all correct, really. It's just, I mean, I think all of us really need to do this because it's not just me who uh, they could get an FOIA for, right? They could do any of us. Mm. Or maybe not Alan, right? They couldn't do Probably, that with you. Mine, mine would be a little trickier. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, Actually, some, some of my emails are covered under non-disclosure agreements. <clears throat> some of my emails are, are privileged communication with sources, which, you yeah, know, yeah. I don't do investigative journalism, but the same laws would protect me. Um, but, yeah. You know, any anybody could do this sort of a, a hit um, on any certainly any publicly funded researcher. Yeah, that's true. Um, I think one one of the important things is to emphasize that this guy's primary mission, Volta's primary mission, is uh, science communication and teaching. Uh, in particular, he's an an, an expert in uh, genetically modified uh, organisms, and right. so he's interested in communicating what the science is, so that people can talk about this sure. uh, intelligently. Okay? Right. Um, and it's a hot button item, though, Rich. You know. Yeah. That. Oh, yeah. It's uh, you, you're playing with fire. That. He yeah. knows that. Of course. He oh, does. he absolutely knows it. He says on this podcast, these people, you know. They ignore the science, and I'm trying to right. set them straight. And I will debate them anywhere at any time. <laughs> I'll be happy to do that, you know. But they they really spread. But you Alan, know, you're, you're the anti-vax people are the same, and there's no oh, way sure. that you can win in the long run as long as they continue to misquote you. Well, and also as long as they can continue to provide the appearance of a controversy, right? And I think we talked about this. With yeah, that's the, right. That's in, right. In this context before that. If they can throw around some terminology that makes you sure. delve into it sure. so that a bystander would say, oh, there's an actual debate going on, yeah. even though one person is talking nonsense and the other person is talking science, right. if they can give the appearance of a controversy, then they've won. Sure. I mean, I've, I've encountered this a lot in my travels because of my association with the, the Vertical Farm Project, and I always say that science is neutral. It's what you do with it that's not neutral. Okay, right. so if you're manipulating plants to resist herbicides, so you can sell more herbicides, <laughs> that's got a kind of an underpinning, uh, self-fulfilling prophecy that that actually feathers your own nest. But if you're genetically modifying a food item like rice to be more nutritious because it has a, a broader spectrum of amino acids and therefore fulfills the dietary absence of that in a an Asian population, which they did then that's a great reason for modifying it. So, you know, science can be used in either direction. So you have to yep. take the specifics and analyze them. He also makes the point he was really not treated well by PLOS. We talked mm -hmm. a little bit about that last yes. time. 
They're trying to distance um, themselves. He talks about an NYU journalism professor who wrote things without actually <coughs> calling him or emailing him and confirming that they happened. He was very upset about that because you know he's a colleague and uh, he didn't. So he goes through all of these things. He, he, it's really unfair what was done, and you know they, they, they basically took emails that were not his and, and concluded that they were his and so forth. So. But he says in the end, you know, they would find other things. If I didn't have this money, they would find other things as well because yeah. he has gone to give lectures yeah. that are supported by these companies and so forth. So they would pick on that. Yeah. So it's unfortunate really what happened. He's And Johannes is right. This could happen to any of us as well. But his thing is, so he ends up saying, the terrorists won, but I'm going to keep doing this. We have to give the money back, but I'm going to keep doing this. I'm going to keep talking and you're not going to yeah. silence me. So yeah. that's good. Good. Yeah. yeah. All right, uh, Kathy, can you take the next one? Uh, I lost where we are. Uh, Jaeger. Jaeger. Jaeger writes, Dear TWIV hosts, let me provide some thoughts on proviruses, sterilizing immunity, and abortive infection. The difficulty with HIV or SIV infection is not the formation of the provirus per se, but the fact that some proviruses end up in reservoirs where the virus gets preserved and then can come out and reseed the infection. Uh, can I can I interrupt for a second? This is in reference to the paper we did last week, where uh, we had a discussion about uh, how uh, there was some evidence that there was it was a an HIV or SIV vaccination paper, and some animals were protected by a DNA vaccine. And there were two patterns of prof uh, protection: one where there was no infection, and another when there was abortive infection. And we questioned how since the virus has to establish an integrated state in order to replicate how it can do an abortive infection because it seems like once you've got a, a provirus, you're there for good. And this addresses that. Sorry. Okay. There's still some controversy about the exact nature of those reservoirs. These could be memory CD4 T cells or stem-like cells from which CD4 T cells originate. And some people believe that follicular T helpers in germinal centers serve as such reservoirs because they are shielded there from CD8 cells, which are not allowed to enter the B-cell follicles. Whatever those long-lasting reservoirs are, the underlying biology of the infected cells is the main reason why HIV and SIV infection persists in the face of antiretroviral therapy or effective immune response, which is observed in elite controllers, not the formation of a provirus. The formation of the provirus may help in this process if for some reason the provirus is not being transcribed for some time and then gets reactivated. However, if a CD4 cell is infected and then killed by T cell immunity, then it does not matter whether the provirus was formed or not. Many infected CD4 cells will die on their own despite the formation of a provirus. If a vaccine boosts the immunity and leads to efficient clearance of infected CD4 cells, then you may see a situation where the virus comes in, starts replicating, then gets suppressed or completely eliminated. In the past, TWIV covered the CMV-based SIV vaccine developed by Lewis Picker and co-workers. To remind you, when he observed, what he observed was robust system systemic replication of SIV, followed by complete suppression of the virus in 50% of vaccinated animals. At the same time, he saw the virus persisting in these animals. Since that episode, he has shown that over time, the virus gets completely eliminated from the body. According to him, the most sensitive test for elimination of the virus is to transfer a large amount of PBMCs from the animal in question to a new non-vaccinated macaque. Mm. If the virus is there, even in tiny amounts, it will grow out and establish infection. Finally, I'm not completely certain that the authors saw two distinct types of protection. The difference between sterilizing immunity and abortive infection is not black and white. Viral replication can be very local and very short, so that you will not be able to detect it by looking for viral genomes in the blood. Sometimes you may detect such cases by detecting immune responses to viral proteins that were not included in the vaccine. I don't have access to the paper, so I don't know how extensively the authors looked for secondary signs of infection, such secondary signs of infection. Hope this was helpful. Igor. And I don't know if we want to stop and then I could do this PS later. Uh, so... Basically, what I get out of this um, is that um, a, a cell that uh, is making HIV or SIV 
will have an integrated provirus and be uh, and be making virus. Um, that cell, because it's be, uh, making and expressing antigens, can be killed, mm -hmm. and so you can get rid of it. All right. All right. And so the the real issue is not the provirus per se, but what it's doing. Right. Because you can have a reservoir of cells that have uh, proviruses that um, aren't doing anything, so they are not targets of killer cells. However. I, I really like this point that he brings out about the paper that we did do uh, about the CMV-based SIV vaccine. Uh, I, I'm getting the impression that if you have really a good enough immune response, uh, there's a chance that you can clear this thing because if it's a good and persistent and robust immune response, then any cell uh, that is a reservoir that starts making virus can be a target and be killed. So you could keep it under control or ultimately eliminate the whole thing. Yep. By talking yep. sense? Yep, absolutely. Mm -hmm. uh, and the other point that he's making here is that uh, we talked about the, uh, the animals that showed no evidence of infection. And uh, I was describing that as sterilizing immunity. And he's saying, well, maybe not. Okay, it could be that there's a little bit of replication that's just so low it's under uh, uh, below the l limits of detection. Fine. Good. Okay. Okay. And he says, P.S., I'm glad to hear that Vincent followed my recommendation and started listening to Hardcore History. Spreading the word about great podcasts is the best way to show your appreciation. I've been advertising TWIV to lots of people. Hope some of them picked it up as well. And Igor is at the Global HIV Vaccine Enterprise, which I've just checked out. Um, it looks like it's based in New York City, but there are uh, members involved from all over the world. I, I think we've talked about this before. Yep. I'm not sure. Yep. Mm -hmm. I met, I met uh, Igor at a city college function not too long ago. The Salk celebration came mm -hmm. up. I uh, said, I'm Igor. I, right. <laughs> oh. I, I really appreciate this letter because it sorts out some yeah. significant questions that we had. Yep. Mm -hmm. Alan, can you take the next one, please? Sure. Ebony writes, Hello, Twivers. I'm a PhD candidate in Michelle Kutzler's lab at Drexel College of Medicine. We're a DNA vaccine lab, and I just wanted to answer your questions about electroporation. The vaccine plasmids themselves are given intramuscularly by regular injection. The Inovio probe has three small probes, which are then inserted around the injection site, and the charge is delivered as three individual pulses of milliseconds uh, separated by a few milliseconds. It takes maybe four to five seconds. As far as pain, I have poked myself on probes, and they do hurt about as much as a needle. The electroporation is so quick, it probably only hurts for a short time. <laughs> Hope this helps. Right, great. Okay. Good. I figured someone would know. Yep. All right. Let's move on to our main topic. And uh, Jens had written us after the New York Times thing and said we should talk about viral taxonomy. So let's do that. Now, Jens, you're a member of the ICTV, right? Yeah, that's right. And um, can you, I don't know how much you know, but. Can you tell ICTV us? ICTV is the International Committee on the Taxonomy of Viruses. And uh, you're paid very well to be on that committee, right? <laughs> <laughs> yes, of course, no payment whatsoever. <laughs> and of course, it's completely underfunded, too. And you have to, and you know, ASV contributes to ICTV. Right. And I, so, I know uh, not so a huge amount, but we do. Right. I mean, the ICTV itself um, uh, is a member of the IUMS, or the International Union of Microbiological Societies. And so pretty much anybody who is doing something with viruses uh, is somehow contributing or working mm -hmm. with ICTV. How so how many members are there of ICTV on the committee? Oh, that's a good question. Um, well, I can look that up really quick for you. So it's a, it's a little bit complicated because um, the ICTV itself is composed of a lot of different, let's call them entities. So, so there's the executive committee. Um, uh, the executive committee right now has probably about 20 people, I would say, 2, 4, 6, 8, 10, 12, 14, 16, 18, 21. Um, and so those are the, the president and the vice president and the individual chairs of the different virus subcommittees. So they are subcommittees for, you know, animal DNA viruses and positive stranded RNA viruses and so on. Um, and then there are individual elected members and they serve kind of as the right hands to these, to these chairs. Um, and then, of course, there's the editor-in-chief for the ICTV report, and so all of these people are sitting in the executive committee. Um, but that's not all, because the, um, the individual executive committee, committee members seek input from subject matter experts, 
Um, and those are being elected into these so-called study groups. Um, and so there's a study group typically for every family of viruses that's out there. Um, and the number of people who are sitting in the study groups uh, varies very much depending mm. on the virus group. Um, and then, uh, and then there are of course live members that can vote um, ultimately that add on top of this. So there's a lot of people. And you're in one of these study groups, right? Uh, yeah. So I'm on the executive committee um, mm -hmm. as an elected member, um, and so I'm kind of the right hand of uh, Stuart Zedell on the animal double-stranded and single-stranded RNA virus subcommittee. Um, and I'm the chair of the Mononega virale study group, the chair of the Filoviridae study group, and I'm on, I think, the Bunia viruses, Arena viruses. Corona viruses and Niami various study groups as a member. So next time you see Stuart Sedell, say hi for me. He and I were postdocs <laughs> together. Will do. And if Great you have to hear about him. If you have some dirt on him, let me know. <laughs> <laughs> so do you have no, more? There's, there's no dirt on Stuart. <laughs> ah, okay. <laughs> do you have more animal virologists on your board or more plant virologists on your ah, board? Ah, that's a fantastic question. Um, so. Let's start with this. My, my good friend Charlie Kellisher told me a long time ago when I started getting into taxonomy that there are three topics at the dinner table you don't discuss. Politics, <laughs> religion, and taxonomy. <laughs> yeah, right. Yes. Exactly. Uh, uh, and so uh, the reason why he said this is because the moment you get into taxonomy, people yeah. get incredibly emotional Correct. and uh, there's a lot of fighting. Um, yeah. And sometimes that's justified and one of those things is what you just brought up. <laughs> So um, I would say traditionally um, the vertebrate virologists were in the vast majority yeah. um, and the plant virologists were kind of suppressed. Um, it has gotten a lot better. Uh -huh. um, we have, of course, a plant virus subcommittee, um, which is uh, uh, chaired by Helene Safason. Um, and we have, uh, I think, now three or four plant virologists on the executive committee as elected members. So in the executive committee, it's getting fair, right. I would say. Right. So previously, um, the plant virologists were silenced, you would say? <laughs> no, they were not necessarily <laughs> silenced. But um, the, So the problem in virology it in general... It was a joke. <laughs> yeah, yeah, well, it's... <laughs> bad, it's to the plant virologists... I know, it's a touchy subject. <laughs> yes, yes. So um, the, the problem with virology in general, of course, is... Um, so I'm looking at virus taxonomy from an evolutionary point of view, and sure. so at the moment I do that, I like every virus equally. Yeah, right? yeah, yeah. I, I find them all fascinating. Right. But uh, in the reality of life, of course, um, people will pay more attention to viruses that cause disease in humans and yeah. after that in animals and after that in plants. So have any, I'm sorry to interrupt you, but have any plant virus snippets or little pieces of RNA or DNA been rescued from fossils like the DNA snippets have for animals? Well, they are, yes. Okay. <laughs> so you could actually look back to these progenitor species or whatever you want to call them as lineages that follow through to the present time for plants no, as well not as that old. They're not all that old. Well, well it, it depends very much. So, I mean, this is getting, um, it's getting, it's going to be a fun discussion. It's going to be very geeky. <laughs> um, it, it's getting very complicated very quickly the moment you ask these questions because, yeah. of course, in many of the, let's start with this. We, right now, if you look into the latest ICTV report, which is the, the, the big book of how taxonomy looks right now that comes out um, and it's published by the ICTV every four to five years or so. If you go into this book and you count the viruses that are covered in this book and that are classified, yes. you will end up with like 3,500 viruses, right? Um, and I would say any virologist who has um, an, an inkling of understanding of diversity knows that this is not even in the realm of, <laughs> <laughs> this right. is, it's ridiculously low, right? Exactly. So, um, so many families that have been established because there's a virus in that it causes disease in humans yeah. um, has been considered, let's say, a vertebrate virus family for a very long time. Now, in recent years, when people started doing all these deep sequencing and metagenomic assays and all this other stuff, it has turned out that, of course, plant viruses and fungus viruses and insect viruses are all in the same family. They're closely related. And one of the prime examples are the Raptoviridae. Right? So you have plant viruses and vertebrate viruses together in that family, and they're clearly related. So it's not like there is a monophyletic lineage of plant viruses over there and another mm -hmm. monophyletic language. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So um, ultimately that means that you have plant virologists and vertebrate virologists and fungus virologists and, and protozoan virologists. They all have to work together if they want to figure out what the actual evolutionary <laughs> language uh, Have they ever worked together? <laughs> well, they're getting there because okay. the, the understanding is increasing for this. but. Yeah. Most virologists haven't really thought about all of this. Yeah. So can we step back just a bit? If How long has the ICTV been working? Um, roughly. I would roughly say 1971. Okay. 
So obviously before that there was taxonomy, right? So how did it work before the ICTV? Well, everybody named something somewhere. Really? <laughs> yes. So, um, so the, you, you can see something like this with bacteriology. It's a little bit easier because they have a better overall coverage of bacteria, right? So if you look at bacteriology, um, there have been like 20, 40, 60 names for the same bacterium uh, for like, you know, decades. Um, until um, the Committee for the Taxonomy for Prokaryotes said, okay, fine, we, we need to somehow fix this. And what they did, and I would say that was probably in the 19, early 1980s or so, they rebooted the entire taxonomy. They just said at a, at a particular time, no name that has been published is valid anymore. It's all like you start from zero. And here's a time frame, and here's the way on how you propose new taxa. And if you provide the following criteria and you put your name in, then we will make this a valid taxon. Um, and then they tried to, to order this. Now, with virology, we're in a little bit of a better state because we don't have thousands and thousands and thousands of different viruses. Um, but that's how this happened in the beginning. Somebody discovered something, he thought it was a new virus, they gave it a name. And so if you, give, if you go into particular virus groups, let's, for example, say the Bunia viridae, um, there are many viruses in there that are named, yet we don't have any sequence information on them whatsoever. And so we don't know whether they're not actually identical to things that are already classified or not. Raptoviridae is very similar. There's, uh, there's I think, probably 100, if not 200 um, plant raptoviruses that are simply have been identified on the shape of the virion in, in an EM slide. And then they've given them, they, they, they give a name to them. But there certainly were families before the ICTV, right? Uh, and someone did, who did that? I know there actually, were actually there weren't families. There were no families. Yeah, so the families come late. Um, it so, starts so, out. It starts out with the uh, uh, International Congress, uh, International Committee on the Nomenclature of Viruses, that morphed into the ICTV later on. So, and before, they started off by identifying uh, viruses that looked like they had things in common, mm -hmm. and they grouped them and as uh, genera. Uh, so it starts off at the genus level. Okay. Okay. So, Most so, of them. Yeah. So virologists do something that I honestly don't quite understand. So virologists classify from the bottom uh, to the top. <laughs> right. Um, whereas everybody else actually goes the other way around. Well, right. but that's and, that's part of the. I mean, viruses. When you're classifying viruses, you run into problems that people classifying, um, shall I say, living organisms don't have. Right. I mean, these are. The, these are a little different. There, there are some issues that come up with how exactly do you what? Where do you put this virus, um, and how do you group something that can that can include members from so many different um, lifestyles? Sure, but I would say you know from on a fundamental level. So here, here's my here's my metaphor on how taxonomy kind of works, right? So I always imagine coming home into my living room and there's a huge pile of clothes coming out of the dryer. Um, and I need to fold this and I need to put them away. Um, and so th what you do is you sort your socks with your socks and your underwear with your underwear and your trousers with your trousers and so on. And so that, that's a classification attempt, right? You say all trousers look the same and they wear, they, I wear them the same so they should go over here. And all of them should probably not stay in the living room. We probably have a special room for that. So you actually start on the high level. No matter what you have in this pile, you start on a very high level. You say, the living room is not the right thing to do. They need to go into my closet. <laughs> and then if you're in a closet, you say, well, the socks go in the drawer. And maybe I don't even fold them. Um, and the, but the trousers, I want to fold them and put them over there. And then, of course, you encounter something that doesn't fit your classification scheme. Right. So you might have uh, swimming trunks. Right, so what is swimming trunks? Are they, is it underwear? Is it at the trousers? So if you have only one swimming trunk, you might say, okay, I'm going to put this into that one little drawer over there until that. But maybe you become a swimmer in a month and you buy 60 different swimming trunks. Then you might have to have a drawer for that. And so I think fundamentally, all taxonomic schemes, doesn't matter whether they're living beings or not, I mean, you can go all the way to planets, um, work on this kind of approach. You have stuff. You want to be able to communicate what you're talking about. And in order to do that, you need to put it in some kind of a figurative drawer somewhere to say all of this stuff belongs over there. Um, sure. And we do this um, in a non-official way. Uh, and you guys do this in every show. You say this is a single-stranded RNA virus. This is a positive-stranded RNA virus. This right. is a DNA virus, right? So this is theoretically equivalent to like a phylum or, a, or whatever you want to call the taxon level. We're using this for communication. So I don't quite understand why we start with like putting this into the right species because that's equivalent of me deciding which straw it goes into yeah. before I decide which mm. room it is. Yeah. So you're, what you're saying is that the ICTV came on the scene and tried to make order of 
of this taxonomy. Yes. Right. And but they did not change bottom to top, top to bottom, though, right? No, we are, we are still doing the same thing. That right. uh, um, I think the the root of all virus taxonomy is still the species. Um, and we will have to have a discussion about what a species is, which yeah. is quite yeah. messy, <laughs> and what a virus is, and so on. Um, and right now, if you look at the taxonomic ranks, um, the highest rank in the virus taxonomy currently is the order. So we have no phyla or classes or something like this. So mm -hmm. we have order, family, subfamily, genus, and species. So when, when ICTV began, um, I don't think there were many viral genome sequences, right? Correct. So, no, what was none. what was classification based on? Um, also, very similar to every other classification, morphology. Yeah, sure. So, you always start, and, and you can, if you go back into zoology, and it's similar, right? So, you have something that has a fur and has right. mammary glands and has four legs. Well, it must be a mammal. Um, so, you you put them somehow in these classes, and then with time, your methodology improves, and you look more into this, and then you have to reclassify, and that is when things get messy, mm -hmm. because people do not like reclassification. Um, for whatever reason, I, I don't quite understand this, but I think it's very, very, um, um, you know, it was always like this. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> That's right. Yeah. So before the onset of, of a lot of sequencing, what was the state of classification? How many, so you say there weren't, there were families, right? How many families were there? Well, look, you go by the you go by the report, and I can actually well let me see. So there's a there's a web page. So for everybody who's interested in this, uh, the ICTB has a web page. It's www.ictbonline.org, uh, um, and the history and the statutes and everything uh, is all on there. And there, there you can also see which proposals are forthcoming and uh, what the study groups are and so on. Um, and they have a history um, page. Here we go, um, and they have a nice little overview. So I can tell you that in 1971. There were zero orders, two families, zero <laughs> subfamilies, 43 genera, and 290 species. Wow. And you can compare this now to the latest release. We have now seven orders, 104 families, 23 subfamilies, 505 genera, and 3,186 3, species. Um, that's still not much, but of course it has improved considerably compared to the first report. Great. So how does ICTV work? Um, do people have to make proposals, or do they actually get proactive and try and order things? Um, well, so in an ideal world, um, you discover something that you think is a new virus. Um, you get your publication out um, and are even more sure that you have something new because it's a live peer review. Um, and then you write a proposal. And so you can go on the web page um, and there is a files and discussion tab and you can download the proposal template. And you fill that out, and it asks you for, um, you know, a phylogenetic tree and uh, genetic distances, and so on and so on. Um, and of course, what you want to name uh, the species that this virus should belong to, um, and then you submit uh, this proposal. Anybody can put any anybody can do this, and anybody actually should do that. Um, so the moment you um, submit this proposal, it goes to the respective study group, um, which is a group usually closest to what you're suggesting. So if you have a new a uh, family member and the family exists already, it will go to the family study group. Um, if you have something completely new, um, then it will somehow go to the subcommittee or the, uh, the family that it's most closely related to and they will decide what to do with it. Um, the, the study groups will discuss this and ideally, hopefully, vote on it in a democratic manner um, and then make the, uh, and move the proposal forward to the executive committee. Um, the executive committee will then um, evaluate each of these proposals. They will vote in the end of whether they're supporting the proposal or not. Um, if it is supported, um, it will move forward to ratification um, and then become official. If it's not supported, it will be sent back to the proposers and the study groups and say, we have the following concerns, you need to address this and that. How long does this take? Um, so, in a... <laughs> <laughs> I feel like a nice thing. Eons. <laughs> uh, no, 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 it does not. So, I mean, it's... A, so, um, I have, I do have pet peeves with the ICTV, and so I, I did take a proactive approach by saying, like, okay, I'm going to become a member of it, so I can actually address the problems that I have with it, rather than staying back and saying mm -hmm. like everything is wrong. Um, so I'm, I'm taking both sides. I also should probably say right now, I'm, I am a member of the executive committee, but I'm speaking my own minds here. So not everything I say is necessarily supported by the executive committee. Um, so in an ideal world, and so there's a deadline every year for the proposal submission. So this year, this was June 15, I think. So let's say you come up with a new virus proposal and you put this in on June 14. 
Um, and everything is just absolutely fantastic with your proposal. There are no problems whatsoever. It goes through the study group. The executive committee says yes. It goes to ratification. Then your uh, new species or new taxon that you propose will become official in January. So, with, so within six months. <laughs> wow. Right? Who um, ratifies? Uh, these are the individual members of the virology division of the International Union of Microbiological Societies. Okay, so it's separate from ICTV members then? Yes, so the ICTV members also vote in the ratification, they're part of it, but there's a lot of people also who vote who are not direct members of the ICTV. Okay. And so, I hope I got this right, and if my ICTV colleagues listen, please write in and correct. It seems like so, uh, if, if I heard you correctly, if you want to, nowadays, if you want to make a proposal, that has to come with sequence data. Is that correct? Yes, that is correct. So, the, the ICTV has adapted, and there's a lot of changes we probably should talk about also. Um, sequences are now becoming the root of classification. The, uh, the, sole, right. the sole root of classification? Uh, not in an ideal case, mm -hmm. um, but they can be. Um, and so, yeah, we, we should probably talk about, um, I think it was a question on the, on the list that you wrote. Yeah, so, so somebody there, can just do the virological equivalent of human genome sciences and plug their sequencer into the ICTV and, and start churning out new virus classifications? Yeah. Uh, yes and no. So, uh, <laughs> as of the, so it is complicated because, of course, the, uh, the executive committee consists of very different virologists with very different background and also very different ages and so on, right? So um, this is not an uncontentious issue. There will be people out there who say sequences are not viruses. There will be people like me who say, like, well, you're talking about variants and variants are not viruses. Um, and and so, so there's a lot of little fighting and stuff. And ultimately, um, there's a consensus decision that people need to vote of what we, are, what we feel comfortable with moving forward. So in the last executive committee um, uh, meeting that we had, um, there was a large consensus um, that viruses can be classified based on sequence data alone if um, certain requirements are met. And so those requirements um, are um, a coding complete sequence for the virus, so not just a fragment of something somewhere, um, a very good coverage um, per nucleotide of that sequence so that you can actually be sure that this thing really does exist. Um, and what they call biological context. So you cannot come with a metagenic example of saying, here at seawater, I found uh, 50,000 sequences, okay. and that can go <laughs> okay. in. Yeah, that's so, so, there is, there, there, so there is a caveat to this. But of course, the ICTV um, also recognizes that we, we, we do have a problem because um, we get bombarded with sequences, and the sequences, of course, are proof that something exists. And, uh, and then it becomes fun. So in the... In the email to you guys, I wrote that I will make this kind of fun by talking about T-Rex, right? T-Rex is classified without a living isolate. So um, <laughs> this, this is an important point. So the, the question, if you look at um, uh, paleontology and uh, or like, you know, hominid species and so on, and uh, yeah. all of these things are classified based on individual small bones that somebody found. Yeah. And yeah. they convinced the entire community that these bones are so specific that you can deduce that this thing has existed. Uh, hmm. um, likewise, for example, you find a cadaver of a giant squid, and we have never seen the giant, uh, or a giant octopus or whatever, and we have never seen the living being, but you have the cadaver right here. Yeah. It would be foolish not to say, well, we can examine this and put it into our classification scheme. Sure. You make so an interesting point, because uh, sequence-wise, the demand now is for a, a genome length uh, sequence, but for T-Rex, you didn't have the whole T-Rex, you just got Correct. bits of it, right? <laughs> right. right. And so that's and, and the same thing for the hominids, right? So if you look at the, the new um, human right. that they found last week, the yeah, yeah. Homo not, not yeah. Thank you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, um, of course, I mean, they did sequencing on those guys, uh, on those, I think it was a fingertip bone or something, yes. but, um, yes. uh, and they actually have good coverage in terms of like what the sample is concerned, but of course they don't have the, the full genome, <laughs> it's impossible. Um, but at the same time, you can say, well, I mean, this is important for us understanding how hominids came about, and of course we need to give this a name, we need to fit it into our schemes. And so that is the discussion that is happening in virology right now. It, uh, so what, yeah. what should be classified, what should not be classified? And to sit here, for example, and say, if you don't have a replicating isolate in tissue culture, we will not classify it, and therefore it will not be labeled correctly in databases and so on is insane. Um, because, of course, the majority of viruses will never be isolated. Yeah, I, I think um, that makes a lot of sense, but I don't see why you can't do metagenomic analysis and get good coverage and get a full genome and, and be able to classify that. What do you mean, actually, by biological context? 
Yeah, so biological context starts first with the idea of where does this actually come from. Mm -hmm. So let's say you discover a new virus in a cockroach. Um, at least you know it comes from a cockroach. And if you can isolate it seven times from cockroaches and not from anything else, then you can kind of say it's possibly a cockroach okay. virus or at least associated with cockroaches. Because, of course, the cockroach could eat something, right? Yeah, yeah. Um, so, um, uh, yeah, or particular cells, or maybe you can do in vitro experiments with, um, let's say you can clone the glycoprotein, you pseudotype viruses, you can delineate um, tissue tropism and so on, and you can by that say, well, this has to be a human virus because it only goes into human cells that we test or something like that. So you have more information mm -hmm. um, than just um, uh, ATG. Okay, um, but, so, but the sequence, let's say you have a plant with a new illness and you isolate a virus and you can show that it's consistently there with the disease, you, you would have to have a sequence with that to submit it to ICTV. I think now you would have to. Yeah, but, but that's not a big deal. That's easy, right? Right, and it's not it's not expensive anymore, and and people can do this. Um, but in the past, this has happened. So um, uh, we have, for example, hepatitis C virus was classified very quickly, um, and there was no isolate for hepatitis C virus for a very long time. So, so uh, go ahead. Go ahead. I'm sorry. Yeah. So I mean, so it you know, so we have. We have a little bit of a patchwork in, in, uh, in virus taxonomy that whenever you say, well, we shouldn't be doing this, I can point you towards one virus where we have done that. Um, and so there's, there's no real consistency yet of what should be done and what should not be done in any circumstances. And so when I, I, I talk a little bit, um, it's a little bit fishy when I say you should have good coverage. Because, of course, the next question is, well, what is good coverage? Yeah, what is good? Is it 5X, 10X, 100X? Right. Yeah. Correct. But ICTV doesn't state exactly how much coverage, right? No, I mean, ICTV is set up very smartly because they have these study groups. And mm. so they defer, of course, the, the best knowledge that you will find about a virus group will be the experts that work on these viruses. And mm. they usually populate or should populate the study groups. And so they will, they will basically give the case to the study group to make the case for the executive committee. And then if the case is like a little bit like a, a, a trial, right? If they make a good case... The executive committee will throw their hands up in the air and say, well, yeah. I'm convinced. So, I, I mean, I have a lot of interactions with people who discover viruses, like Ian Lipkin here, um, Jean-Michel Clavery, for example. And I'll just tell you a couple of the things they've told me over the years. So, from someone in Lipkin's lab just this week, he said that the sequencing has destroyed taxonomy. Uh, and then Clavery, a couple of years ago at, at a giant virus meeting, he was complaining bitterly about ICTV because he said they take too long and um, they don't recognize viruses unless you do as you say. You know, you have to have some biological context. And, of course, he pulls viruses out of Siberian permafrost. And we don't know, I think for most of the viruses he's identified, we don't know what the real host is, right? Right. Um, well, I would say, so this is, my personal opinion. Um, okay. But so I would say it's halfway fair what both say. Um, I mean, we do have this problem that I mean, ultimately, I personally think the ICTV is way too slow. Um, I, I think this should this should and has to move in a way where um, proposals can be made on maybe a weekly basis and can be evaluated on a weekly basis, maybe even by a computer algorithm to come forward with some kind of a preliminary classification and only if um, people come in and say that cannot be right, then the case will be reviewed mm. because we will get thousands, tens of thousands and hundreds of thousands of viruses um, very soon. I mean, there's, I, there's no doubt in my mind. So I actually even think that this paper that Ian published a while back where he estimated the diversity of vertebrate, vi um, I think, mammal viruses. Yeah, right. And he came up with like 50,000 or something. Um, I, I will, I'll bet money that he is off by an order of magnitude. <laughs> mm. um, so because whenever somebody actually looks at a particular organism, um, he will find a particular virus in that organism. And we yeah, know how many right. organisms we have. That's right. That's right. So that's if you right. just look into something like um, how many nematodes are there, I yeah. can tell you there will be a lot of viruses. They're just beetles. <laughs> uh, that's right. All of, all of these creatures. And then we're not even talking about like, you know, sub um, microscopic little creatures, unicellular right. organisms, and all of this other stuff. And uh, the big elephant in the room for virus taxonomy, of course, are phages. <sighs> So um, it, we will have a problem with this, and at that very moment, the question is: Is this information when when is something sufficient or not? I think it has something to do with people getting uh, used to the idea um, that you can take a sequence, and the sequence theoretically has most of the information what a virus is. We just can't necessarily read it yet. Why is no. it, well, the phages are elephants because we don't know the hosts? 
Well, because of course, first of all, you don't know the hosts. Um, so you take usually this is like let's say seawater, right? And you find all of these phage sequences, and uh, you, there, there's no there's no incentive for us um, to sit down and say, okay, I'm going to take five hundred thousand different phage viruses. Mm. Now I'm going to take five hundred thousand bacteria species. I'm going to match them. Yeah. And no, nobody will ever do this. And that's what I meant before when I said um, you know re- uh, insisting on an isolate is insane because if the virus is not in, in quotation marks important for us for some reason there will be no funding and nobody will even try to right. isolate it. Um, and then the other part with uh, with phages uh, is there's so many simply because there's so many bacteria out there. So there's there's it is insane um, what is being discovered and being dumped into GenBank. Um, and uh, the poor prokaryotic um, uh, subcommittee that has to deal with this. I mean, I, I, I really feel pity with them. So you think we can't classify any of those phages unless we know the host? Uh, well, I, I, think, I think ultimately we'll have to, um, because if we want to understand how phages came about, if we want to understand whether um, there are phages that are, that they, whether there are monophyletic lineages of phages, if we want to understand whether phages are related to, say, positive-stranded RNA viruses like flaviviruses and so on, um, we need a good sequence space. And in order to get a good sequence space, we need to you know, annotate and deal with these things, and so we need to name it. And the moment you need to name them, you're de facto classifying them. Sorry, Alan, I interrupted you. Hey, well, no, that's, you, were, you were following that thread, and that was, that was productive. Um, but in addition to the, the sheer numbers that we're dealing with already, and that, as you say, are going to get even bigger, um, it seems like really at the root of this whole thing is the fundamental issue that the viruses didn't get the memo, right? They, they don't honor any of these categories. <laughs> so this is, this is a system we're fundamentally imposing on nature and drawing divisions within something that's actually just a big glob of goo, right? Well, um, so it's a good question, but ultimately, so, okay. Um, every taxonomy, of course, is that, right? Yes. So, I mean, I, I'm, I'm going to, I was worried that you're going to ask me for a pick later, so I'm going to do it now. Um, there, there's, um, there's this wonderful little book that I, that I read a while back, and it was called How I Killed Pluto and Why It Had It Coming. Ah, yes. Um, oh, yeah. and, and, if you, and if you read that book, there's, a, there's actually a section in the back, and it reads, you could plug it directly into an ICTV report. Uh, he's basically talking about taxonomy of planets. Um, and so he says the reason why Pluto was, in quotation marks, demoted is because, well, there's a definition set of what a planet is. And, of course, we're making this up, right? I mean, we are saying it needs to be yeah. around circles around the sun or whatever, and then it's, we call it a planet. Um, and, of course, people who study this make it more complicated and say they need to be on these trajectories and so on and so on. And then if you look at this, then Pluto didn't fit in. Okay, and then there's a large faction of people who say, well, Pluto has to stay a planet. Well, if you do that, then you need to amend the definition. If you amend the definition, then suddenly 10,000 Cupid Belt things fall into that. Um, so every taxonomic decision is a, uh, some kind of a compromise of increasing our understanding of relationship of things, ideally between viruses, ideally on an evolutionary scale and so on, and practicality in terms of how is this useful for us. Right. Um, and so useful for me is when, uh, when you guys talk about poliovirus, then I have a pretty good idea that this is not a negative strand RNA virus, right? right. Or at least I should. Um, but this, this, um, this difficulty of drawing these distinctions, especially with viruses, um, I mean, because viruses disobey this even more than bacteria, right? Well, there is, of course, a lot of horizontal gene transfer, and uh, the genomes are completely messy. And that's true right. for prokaryotics in general. I mean, the, 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 the bacteria are also completely messy. So um, the art of all of this is, in the end, to find something that is somewhat stable. Right? And right. so if you, if you go into, um, let's say, the mononega viralis, uh, actually all the negative-stranded RNA viruses, you can make a monophyletic tree of all of them um, based on the core domain of the RNA polymerase. Um, so now the question then comes, okay, do you have a monophyletic tree now of those viruses or do you have a monophyletic tree of core domains of polymerases? Right. <laughs> um, and at that very moment, you need to think about, well, so how I look at it is we have, if you look at the mononega viruses, because those are dear to my heart, there was a classification that was created over the years, mainly based on, from, uh, on, on a morphology of the virions in the beginning. And then after a while, on like, you know, it's a negative stranded um, uh, RNA genome. It is not divided and so on and so on. And so a taxonomic scheme uh, was created. Now we have full sequences of all of these core domains. And if you overlap um, the, the core domain monophyletic tree with what we artificially created based on morphology and other criteria, you'll see that there's a 90% overlap. 
Right. So I take this as a as an example that uh, the core domain uh, monof monopoly is pretty reliable to be the monopoly of all those viruses. So the question is whether you can do this on multiple levels to increase your, your, your certainty about this and whether you can do it for other viruses. And so I'm not a DNA virologist, um, so, but I'm bringing up the pox viruses and all the other really big viruses. They have hundreds of genes and many genes that you do not find in any other relative pox virus, but they have core genes and these core genes you've always find in all of them. And I hope I'm not going to be wrong with this, but pretty much also in the same order. So there, there seems to be some kind of evolutionary pressure to maintain this particular set of things. So maybe you can do similar things for prokaryotes. Right. And so, you, viruses. so you can pick characteristics that that overlap and give you some kind of category like structure, even if the viruses are are blending across those lines, it still gives you a practical um, category is, is what I'm getting at. It's something that you can refer to and you know that all viruses meeting that definition at least have this set of characteristics because that's how you define the group. Correct. And I mean, that's right. what we do with all things in life, right? So right. everything, we, I mean, there's always the outlier and you will always find a few that don't, that don't quite fit. Now that's what makes this a polythetic system, right? That you've it's multifactorial and you can allow for exceptions within it. Right. So this is a very important, a very important point. Um, so in the early definition, so I have to somewhere here, let me see. So the original species definition um, of the ICTV was that a virus species, which is a taxon, we really need to talk about that, um, is a polythetic class of viruses constituting a replicating lineage and occupying particular ecological niches. And what was meant with this is that if you create a list and say mononegaviruses are negative stranded, uh, have a negative stranded RNA genome that is, uh, that is undivided and they are enveloped um, and they have five core genes and so on, that if you find a virus that has five core genes uh, as a negative stranded RNA genome is enveloped but it's segmented, doesn't mean that it's not a member of this group anymore. Right. That's what polythetic means. So it's not a list of everything that needs to be checked. It means that the kind of majority of things need to fit in there and then the group needs to be comfortable that this is not a deal breaker. Right. Um, because otherwise you are, well, sorry, screwed. Right. <laughs> so, and and the, the, the opposite of that would be a monothetic system where you Correct. have to meet this set and if you miss any of those characteristics, then you're not in the group. That's right. But that and would my, be, under, my understanding that, is that uh, early on the, there was an attempt to uh, uh, create a monothetic classification system in the taxonomy, uh, but people couldn't decide uh, which characteristics uh, should be chosen as the uh, single, uh, as the most important characteristics and what the hierarchy of those characteristics could be. There was no good way of doing that. And so the, the alternative was to create a polythetic classification system. So the right. polytheists won. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, the, the problem in general is, of course, what is an important criterion, right? right. So, I mean, right if on. I give you a virus where I say, well, it has all the criteria of a mononega virus, but it has a positive stranded RNA genome, then I would say probably everybody in the group will say, ah, it's not a mononega virus. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, so, um, it, 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 is a, it is a messy thing, and people will discuss. And so, I, we have the mononega viruses right now, we did um, classify uh, two virus groups into the mononega virus just recently, um, the varicosa viruses and the decora viruses. And both of those groups, they are absolutely clearly raptoviruses. So by, by sequence homology of all of their genes and proteins and so on, and they're, they're very clearly raptoviruses, but they don't have envelopes and they're segmented. So, so that they made the, it in. Uh, the, uh, the other thing that I've uh, understood is that uh, early on, um, when they decided on a polythetic uh, system, uh, there were attempts made to have some sort of uh, organized way or some sort of algorithm to uh, uh, consider different characteristics for classification so that you could take a new virus and grind it through this algorithm. And that seemed impossible as well. It was just too many uh, variables, and so the solution was to just create committees. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, I, think study groups. I think that's how this how this started out. I mean, there are methods that you can use. The question is, how comfortable are people with those methods? Right. So um, we have looked um, in the last. 
two or three years at the various negative strand RNA virus groups um, by looking simply at pairwise comparisons of genomes. Um, and you can come up so with an algorithm where you can say, like, you know, if this virus is 35%, more than 35% identical to this, but less than 35% than that, then it will go into this category and so on. And if it doesn't fit into anything, then the algorithm can tell you this should be a new species. Um, and so we did this for the arena viruses in the last round. Um, so Eming Bao at NIH is pretty much the PASC king. Um, that, uh, there are several methods, PASC, DMARC, and, and so on that do that. Um, and then we, we tried again, we looked at overlap, right? So people are very uncomfortable with um, pairwise comparisons because it's not really a phylogenetic kind of way of looking at things. Um, but what came out is that all the species that had been created before were actually supported by, by this method. Yeah. Um, and so it, this is possible. The problem is um, when your methods spit out results that the individual virologists simply don't like. Um, and so that is, I mean, a lot of people feel very strong connections to their viruses. And so <laughs> if, if a new methodology says this is not what you, this is the Pluto discussion, right? If a new methodology right. says Pluto right. is not a planet, right. you will suddenly have thousands of people running around with a sticker on their card, leave Pluto a planet. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> so this may bring up what, what you alluded to in your letter and what you were just talking about a minute ago with the arena viruses, that maybe they're going to get reorganized as being Bunya viruses. Um, and... And so, I'd just like to hear a little more about that, but also to interject that my broad feeling about taxonomy is that there are lumpers and splitters. Yes. And in this case, if you want to put the arenas in with the bunyas, then you're lumping. Just Yeah, so the problem, so I think I wrote my second email to you guys when you discussed the, uh, the uh, MRA viruses a while back. Yeah, and, uh, yeah. I'm sorry, I chuckled while I was running. Um, so, yes, the Bunya virus group um, is complicated because there are a lot of virus groups that clearly fit into this larger, let's call it a super family or something, um, that are closely related to individual genera of that super family. So, for example, the, the, um, if you look at Tinui viruses, um, which are plant viruses, um, they are very closely related to flavoviruses. So, they're closer related if you do. Um, nucleocapsid uh, uh, phylogenetic trees if you do core domain L um, genes and so on. Um, so they're closer related to the flavoviruses than they are related to the orthobunia viruses and the nairo viruses. But right now, um, we defined the, the bunya viruses as having five genera, flavoviruses, nairo viruses, tospos, hunters, and orthobunias. Um, so there is no space for them in there right now because, they, because the tenui viruses have characteristics that don't fit the general definition of what a bunya virus is. And so the Amara viruses are very similar because they have more segments than three. And right now, the definition of a Bunya virus is it has three segments. Right? Mm -hmm. So the moment you allow these kind of groups um, to be considered as members of the overall Bunya group, at that very moment, other groups um, have to fit in there as well. There goes the that's, neighborhood. Right. <laughs> and, and that's kind of, kind of what so, happens with arena viruses. The arena virus um, uh, relationship to Bunya viruses was published a long time ago um, based on, on nuclear protein structures and nuclear protein sequences and so on, and now based on, uh, on L core domain uh, uh, structures and on there's a, there's a functional domain and OTU protease domain, both in, uh, I think, in nairoviruses and in arena viruses, and they cluster wonderfully together. So you see that they kind of fit together in some kind of a way, but of course they're also quite different from each other. So simply making the arena viruses an additional genus in the, uh, in the Bunya very they will not work. Um, that is not right, because then you disrupt everything, but you're not solving anything. But yeah. if you dissolve the entire family and you allow the Amara viruses and Tenui viruses and so in, and you create a new phylogeny of all of these things, then that might work. So how about creating an order Correct. that uh, that, cr that contains Arena and Bunya? Right. Well, it would have okay. to be, but, but, the, but the Arena viruses from the phylogenetic point of view cannot be separated from the Nairo viruses. So it would have to be an order that contains somehow a family that is nairoviruses plus arena viruses, and then a right. sister family which would be hunter viruses and so on. And so that's exactly where this discussion is going, and it's happening everywhere, um, mm, just right. depending on how active the virologists are, because we now have segmented flaviviruses um, that, uh, that have been published, or, or flaviviruses-like things, you know, that, uh, that mm. some fit in there. Um, we have a lot of viruses forthcoming from arthropods that, um, like, for example, the mononegaviruses that 
um, are clearly mononegal viruses on many levels, but they don't have a G protein. And um, and we defined all of these viruses having five core proteins, you know, N, G, M, L, and whatever I'm missing, P. Um, and so all of this stuff is kind of messy, and it, it, and it mixes everything up, and you need to basically have an open mind and saying, okay, did, do I learn something new about here, and is it useful um, to put these things together or not? And so the lumping and splitting thing is a valid concern, because there's always somebody who says, well, we, this is something new, it's my virus, I discovered it, we should give it <laughs> order by itself, because it's so important. That's right. So, uh, I mean, in the end, that's what it's about, to because taxonomy is to help you understand the virosphere, right? Right. So... You have to make it useful for, for virologists, not just complicating things. Right, and that's the compromise that I was speaking about. Yeah. So I, I would like to ideally have a phylogenetic tree where I can say clearly this virus is related to that. But I also want to have it in a way that I can still have an overview and we can talk on your podcast about this virus group and everybody knows what we're talking about. Yeah. But for right. just for as an example, if you have mononegavirale, you would not classify in that a virus with a positive strand RNA genome, right? Or would you, based on, if you found the sequence said it, it really looks like a negative strand, but it's a plus gene, would you put it in there? Well, it's a, it's a wonderful hypothetical example. So, I mean, the, in a very hypothetical world, I'm not really sure, maybe this is one of those um, um, Talmud questions uh, for, for <laughs> Hyper or something. Um, true, true. May, maybe it is possible that um, you have... I'm making this up on the fly now. Let's say you have a, a cell that is infected with a negative strand RNA virus, and at the same time it's infected with some kind of a retrovirus element or whatever, and you create a um, positive strand RNA genome that has by accident the right packaging signals yeah. and so on that, you, that a virus evolves that is basically just a, a mirror image of a, of a negative strand RNA virus, then I would say, yeah, it probably yeah. should fit into that. So, I mean, we, we have already done that with the picornid viruses. So, for example, enteroviruses used to be the viruses that infect your enteric tract. And then after sequencing was done, it was clear that rhinoviruses are very related to polioviruses. So they're all enteroviruses, which drove a lot of people crazy. But I think that's sort of an example of the flexibility you have to have. You may put a name on, but then later that name is not really what you're classifying on anymore. Right. Correct. And that, that's, um, so there, there are two important points here. So the one is the name. I really want to say something real quick. People are way too attached to names. Mm. I mean, this <laughs> Especially really, if their name is on it. <laughs> yes. I mean, this really needs to go. I mean, the, the, the problem with every single discussion I have in taxonomy with people is about we should not name it this, we should name it this, because then it has the following information. Yeah. This uh, is all ultimately mute, because the next discovery that you make um, will negate everything that you thought the information was. And so, and we have this everywhere. So, if you just look in your in your um, your daily discussions about life, right? So, I have a, I have a list here that I actually made. Neanderthals, they are found everywhere, not only in Neanderthal. Um, we have <laughs> European rabbits, and they're found in Northwest Africa. <laughs> right. We have monkeypox virus, which is usually not found in monkeys but in squirrels. Right. We have an Ebola virus that is named after the Ebola River, which is actually 200 kilometers away from where the outbreak was, and now it's in West Africa, so it makes right. no sense. Right. We have jellyfish. They're not fish. Starfish. You, starfish they're not made out of jelly either. Right. Um, <laughs> so um, they, are, they are plant-eating tyrannosaurids, so they're obviously not that right. radical. Um, strawberries are not berries, and so on, and so on, and so yeah, on. Yeah. Right? And so centip makes, centipedes don't have 100 legs. And right? That's right. That's a good example. <laughs> centipedes don't have 100, and millipedes certainly don't have 1,000. Um, so centipedes can have, actually have more than 100, right. um, but they have uneven segments, and so therefore you, end, you never end up with 100. You end up with 98 or 102 or something like that. So um, this naming is something that has basically a historical context. Somebody came up with this, um, and from that very moment on, I know if you offer me a strawberry that this is yummy and I want one. Uh, <laughs> not necessary for me to say, like, well, there's neither a straw in there nor is it a berry. Da, 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 da. <laughs> you can blame Linnaeus on a lot of this. <laughs> so, yes. so well, Jens, Jens what possible. do you do if you don't? I, I totally understand this naming issue. Would you just give viruses binary numbers? That's it? Or what? Could. Well, so there, there are people, I think Stuart um, is one of those people who, who argues we should give them basically just classifying numbers, right? Yeah. Um, personally, I'm adamantly against this because we will not have a podcast where we'll say, um, today we're going to talk about zero, <laughs> exactly. zero, five. <laughs> Nobody can remember numbers. And yeah, so that's no. also why I personally hate um, species names and virus names that end in numbers. Right. right. Mm -hmm. So there, there, are, there are classification schemes out there, um, and I don't want to offend, but yeah. um, for example, if you look at um, 
is it polyoma viruses? No. Um, there, there's a group where, where basically everything's called alpha, beta, gamma, delta, and so on until the end uh, of the alphabet, and then they start again with a prefix and alpha, beta, gamma, delta, and so on. And I don't believe that there's any one expert in this group that if I ask them what is the difference between uh, uh, dio, omega, blah, blah, blah virus and beta, blah, blah, blah virus, that uh, will be able to give me an answer. So um, uh, People are incredibly bad with, with memorizing alphabets and numbers and this has studied over and over and over again. The moment the numbers go over, I think yeah. eight or something you don't remember. So a cool name <laughs> is nice and you can come up with a lot of cool names and the zoologists and, and uh, bacteriologists have shown us this. I mean, there is not nematode, nematode one and nematode two out there. We have species names for every single one of them. Sure. But you should also be able to change those names. So in addition oh, yes. to, to stopping Pluto from be a, being a planet, you should be able to do something about Uranus. <laughs> you know, pinworm, that, that leads right into my subject. So, <laughs> so what I, I had the privilege as a graduate student at uh, Notre Dame to have a sit-down with G. Evelyn Hutchinson. And I don't know if anybody here knows that name, but he uh, was a biologist that taught at Yale and uh, helped establish the uh, Yale School of Forestry. But he, what, he, what he was an expert on was uh, uh, the mathematization of ecology. And so he wrote a, a big treatise on what is the niche. He, he tried to define the niche. And he wrote it uh, and then gave a talk after some ecological dinners at a society called Concluding Remarks, which has been published numerous times. And it's totally unreadable after the third paragraph because it's all in mathematical notations. Mm -hmm. And I can't imagine anybody being awake at the end of this talk. But it concluded, and correctly so, that if you can define the niche, then you can define a species. And the species that you define is definable by the niche that it occupies. And one of the interesting conclusions from his calculations were that no two species, different species, can occupy the same niche. So you're dealing with entities now that occupy molecular niches, basically. You're describing... Uh, at the molecular and atomic level sometimes, the integration of these genomic invaders that then take advantage of a, a niche, which is basically, let's say, in muscle cells or liver cells, basically the niche is essentially the same, but of course it's not exactly the same. But, it, but from cell to cell, if it's the same cell type, you're assuming that the niche is about the same. So mm -hmm. what, it, what are the niches for these viral particles that come up on deep sequencing, like, say, from a, a pint of ocean water. Oh, we and don't know. You get zillions of viral sequences, and you don't have you know. no idea of where, there's, where their niches are. So <clears throat> how, uh, the, the use of the word species is upsetting to people that think they know what a species is, and, of course, nobody does. Oh, well, it's that, interesting. That's it's, it, species. <laughs> it, it's interesting that in the uh, uh, virus species definition, uh, it requires that uh, it occupy an ecological niche. And in the proposal, as I, if I heard it correctly, that uh, Jens was making, they won't consider, the ICTV won't consider classifying a new virus unless, uh, what, there's a biological context? Yeah, that's right. Mm -hmm. It strikes okay. so me deep as the sequencing same kind of, thing. of uh, of a vent or of no, a no. ocean water no. that doesn't count no right and so right. but it, it's getting very tricky right because uh, the moment you do let's exactly. say enteroviruses um, <laughs> right you have a fecal sample right so you the do. fecal sample is actually where it belongs so Roseanne Rosanna Dana once on a Saturday Night Live was a uh, up at arms about endangered feces. What is this I hear about endangered feces? And of course, she was hard of hearing. So Chevy Chase said, it's not feces, it's species. And she says, oh, never mind. So on that, in that level, I mean, basically, you're right. Those are extruded viruses that came out of a niche. They couldn't possibly be living freely. They had to be occupying some intracellular niche, right? right. But there are lots of organisms there, so you got to... No, no, of, right, course, right. of course, of course. I think that's course. reasonable. I think otherwise it gets out of control, and anyone who has... 12,000 new sequences su submits them to ICTV and they go crazy. And it's not, as, <laughs> as Yen said, it's not valuable to, to classify them if, if you don't know that where they're right. if all you, from. Right. If all you have is a snippet of a sequence from some ocean water, you don't actually need to be able to refer to it as a species because you're not going to be having a discussion with specialists who work on it. Yeah. Right, but I mean, but of course the example that you brought up before with um, you know we find a new ginormous virus somewhere in in permafrost. 
Yes. Um, it's of course the moment the virus is completely different, <laughs> and it upsets our and our entire understanding of what viruses are. Yeah. At that very moment, it becomes an important thing to deal with this. And yeah. so, so there's always there's always the exception to the rule where you where you need to think about okay, should we classify this or not? So some of these big viruses from. Uh, Siberia and other aquatic and some aquatic areas where they're grown in amoeba, but we don't know their hosts. Those have been classified, and ICTV has approved some of those, right? Right, and I and I so I'm not a member of that of that study group or of that committee, but I would say it has been done because you have an ecological niche. I mean, the amoeba seems to be tolerating this, um, whether it's the primary niche or not. Uh, that's a different question, but at least you have some kind of an idea where this thing can grow and. and okay. That's good to know. All right. That makes sense. I think that's fine. So you had mentioned that there are some new things happening with, um, what was it, um, satellites and virophages, right? Yeah. So there's a lot of discussion. of. So ultimately, the entire discussion uh, is, is like, what is a virus? And I, I assume you must have had some discussions on Twitter about this. <laughs> sure, sure. Um, and so if you look into the, um, so the ICTV um, works on the basis of a code, like all the taxonomic um, organizations do that. They have, a, they have a code, and this year is called the International Code of Virus Classification and Nomenclature. And they lay out all the rules of how to classify and um, what you have to name it and so on and so on. And if you take a close look at this code, is it doesn't start out with a, a sentence, a virus is. It's not there, right? And so, I mean, this is my main criticism, but my big problem is also I'm not really sure what to write there. Um, so there's a, there's a discussion among individual people of what should be under the purview of the ICTV and what should not be. So for a while, um, prions were under the purview of the ICTV, which <laughs> simply from a, from a uh, because they were sub-viral particles, right? That's what they were called for a <laughs> time. Um, but of course, they have nothing to do with viruses. No. Um, so the question is, where do you draw the line? What what is a virus? And so, for example, viroids. Viroids are classified according to the rules of the ICTV. Although the ICTV is not called the International Committee on Taxonomy of Viruses and Viroids. So for me, that's uh, as an OCD German, that's a problem. I would either rename the <laughs> committee or I would say viroids are viruses and not called viroids anymore. Um, do you know of any? Excuse me for interrupting. Do you know of any virus sequence? Which relates to energy metabolism. I would say if there are some, then those are those mimi and mama viruses. Yeah, we have not seen that yet. You haven't seen it no. yet. So one definition of a virus might be that it requires all of its metabolic energy from the host. Well, that's mm. part all. of the def that's part of a definition. Yeah, but right? that, that's a start, though. It has to get inside of a cell that, to reproduce. that really differentiates it from all other. What we would call forms of life, well, but they're bacteria that have to get inside cells to reproduce. Also, but they have genes but they don't require for all of time. their energy from the host. Yeah. That's well, right. Well, the That's common right. definition of a virus it's an obligate intracellular parasite, right? And right. then the viroids make it hard because I'm thinking, you know, nucleic acid wrapped in protein and sometimes membrane, but viroids don't have that, right? They're just naked nucleic right. acid. Yeah, and, and, you know, and we're we always talking about the origin of life as some autonomously replicating DNAs or RNAs, which we think were the primordial viruses. So, you know, right. And like do you viruses. want to start constructing a taxonomy of transposons? <laughs> and that, yes, yeah. and, that's, and that's exactly yeah. where this is going. So yeah. the, uh, the problem is you have monophyletic lineages, and uh, and I, I promised I, I will call out working for revenge for calling me out last time in my TWIF. So <laughs> Wil Wilkin Johnson is the uh, the chair of the uh, uh, retroviridae study group, um, and he has not classified anything. Um, so um, <laughs> that, uh, oh, yeah, oh, yes, that's right. Oh, he, can't, he, he can't decide. Um, no, I mean, it's, it, because it is it is very complicated to deal with many of these entities. It's easy to um, to classify another lentivirus, right? I mean, they are very clear. But um, there are very good articles out there on people who very nicely link all the individual entities that encode a, a reverse transcriptase. So, um, and first of all, of course, these are not all RNA viruses. So we have the Hepatina viruses and so on, the DNA viruses. Um, so they would have to somehow be under an umbrella together in some kind of a way because the entire way of replication is unique among these viruses. You don't find it anywhere else, so they must be linked somehow phylogenetically. Um, but then there are also all these elements that um, are clearly related to retroviruses, but we don't consider them viruses. And so those are the retrotransposons, the retrons, um, all of these little mobile elements. And many of these mobile elements, they 
well, they're part of the genome of the host. Um, so what are they? Are they the host or are they things that are coming out? They don't necessarily encapsulate things. They don't necessarily leave their cells. But if you do phylogenetic trees or if you look at the genome structure and everything else, they clearly cluster with retroviruses. So what, what do you do with these things? Do you classify them or don't? Um, and so we had the same problem with, with satellite viruses now and with virophages and so on. So, so, the, so, the, so the most fundamental, the lowest definition of a virus you can make is that it is an obligate intracellular parasite. And if you start adding anything else to that, you run into trouble. Right, but if that's the only definition, I will come at you and say I'm going to put a little nice, cute little protozoan directly in your yeah, body. Me too, right? me too. Yeah. I could put a whole bunch right. of things there. But they don't they do some things on their own? Name it. I don't know. You're the protozoan. I'm uh, telling Dixon. you, some of them do and some of them don't. But. Some protozoans make energy, right? No, I didn't say they didn't. But. So vi no virus but makes energy. But they're obligated to tell you parasites. No, but th th those are two separate things. Yeah, I understand. So, I mean, viruses can make their genomes and their proteins. They can't make energy or Correct. membranes and so forth. They don't need to because they're totally dependent right. upon so the cell. Right, so these protozoans can do some of these things. That's Maybe they're an energy parasite. Okay, so let's stay with energy parasite. I like this, actually. It's cute. Um, energy parasites. Let, let's, let's say these are they're obligate parasites. They require um, energy and stuff. That's your definition. According yeah. to that definition, yeah. Yeah. satellite viruses, helper viruses, and so on, then are viruses. Yes. Right. They're partial viruses. I'm Good. Okay. I'm glad because that's what we decided. I'm okay. <laughs> I'm okay with that. Yeah, that's fine. So you decided that those are all viruses now? Yes, because fundamentally, um, fundamentally, all of these things are simply entities that depend on some other entity mm. to right. get their replication cycle right. done. And of course, they have properties of viruses. Many of the um, uh, helper viruses that are out there, they make capsids, they look like viruses, they have the same structures and the same microsahedral shapes and so on. So they're by all definition uh, viruses, except that they're dependent on another virus. Right. So wait a minute, we got... Uh, there's history in the making here. Did I? Did I? Uh, am I correct that this idea of an energy parasite arose from Dixon You're just right. in the last ten minutes or so? No, no. We talked about this early on in uh, Virology 101. Also, yeah, Dixon talks a yeah. lot about the energy issue. Yeah, because it's yeah. a big issue. It's a big issue. Well, you know okay. who to contact, right, to see whether this is a good definition or not. <laughs> yeah. you, you go directly to Eugene Kunin and then see what he says. There you go. Oh, actually, that would I would be interesting to hear what he would have to say about that. I can tell you what his definition of a virus is. Yeah, what is it? Okay. Um, here, we, uh, here we very generally define viruses as follows. Obligated, obligate intracellular parasites or symbionts that possess their own genomes encoding information required for virus reproduction and, hence, a degree of autonomy from the host genetic system, but do not encode a complete translation system or a complete membrane apparatus. What about energy? Yeah, what about energy? That's not here. That's what I'm saying. It's yeah, really interesting so it's, to ask him. Ah, uh, and so he, he writes here, the, um, this definition applies to any truly selfish genetic element. The key phrase here is encoding information required for virus reproduction, hence possessing a degree of autonomy. Thus, regular genes and operands do not fit this definition, right. even though they may possess some selfish properties. You know, um, the problem is that I mean, we do energy and translation and membranes, but there's other things too, you know, the transport systems of the cell, all yep. this stuff that it's just too much to list, right? It takes advantage of all of the machinery of a yeah. cell. But there are many things. So I think depending on which virus group you are living in, right? so whether you're a vertebrate virologist or like a plant virologist, there are many things that viruses do that the other group is usually not aware of. Mm. Yeah. But I so, think there's so a... Think Sorry. There's a basic problem in trying to develop a nice, clean definition yeah, that's anything. definitive, that's 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 brightly bounded here, um, because we are dealing with an artificial construct that we're superimposing right. on right. this yeah. mass. It will never be clean, right? And and what we need is not a, a definition we can put into a computer algorithm. What we need is some general guidelines. Um, I mean, you don't have to define it, but you have to know it when you see it. Yeah, but pe Alan, people who are not scientists want to know what is I a know. virus. So we yes, need to have a good definition. I mean, we do. A but it's okay. For them. But it's okay if there are some holes in that definition. Yeah, I guess so. I mean, if they're smart enough to point it out, that's great. It means they're then thinking. Then you can continue right? the conversation. Yes. Yeah. Sure. So, so what is the what is the basic definition we're going to give to everyone? <laughs> So it's it sounds a, like this obligate is going to be a polythetic definition. <laughs> yes. <laughs> obligate intracellular parasite. That's an energy parasite. And translational translational parasite. parasite. Yeah. 
Let us yes. start. I, I would start with viruses are not animals, plants, funguses, and chromosomes. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Excellent. And, and, and then start with the sentence of what they are, because then you can inc exclude a lot of different things. Uh, so it, it is definitely a, a, difficult, a difficult question. And uh, of course, it gets very messy the moment you have you know, these mosaics and viruses where you have 90% um, alignment um, over the genome and then 10% are completely different and what you do there. And so this, this is all is an ongoing discussion and, uh, and it will change constantly. And so the, sure. the, the one thing that I'm trying to get across to most virologists, and I, I, I do get hate mail, like literal hate mail <laughs> um, on, on these things, is I think all virologists have to um, get to terms with the idea that all the names that we have are for grabs. Yeah, I think that's fine. Yeah. Because there's just too that's much fine. stuff coming. And, and we are fine. used to this as scientists. And every article we write, you write the introduction and you go into PubMed or whatever source and you see what's new in my field. Um, and then you add the additional sentences that now this paper has been published and this paper has been right. published. And I don't think it's a big problem to say if there is a good source and there is not. Um, but if there's a good source, you go to this source and say, yeah, what's my virus called this week? So yeah, that, yeah, yeah. Jens, what are, you, what are you calling satellites and virophages? Just viruses? Is this I, I, I do, yes. I, I will call these viruses, but the, the, the word satellite will remain. So I, I told you we need to speak about species versus viruses, so maybe that's the right time now. But um, the word satellite will remain in the virus name to, um, to not obscure its original, mm -hmm. uh, its origin. And what about virophages? Uh, virophages, same thing. We will, so they will be classified in a, in a viral taxon, so the species will contain the word virus. Okay. Um, but the virophage itself uh, will still be called Sputnik and Sambilon and whatever they are called. Hmm. So it won't be a um, subviral particle or... No, they're viruses. Or helper virus. There's no more of that, right? Well, there's the, the, I think the phrase helper virus and so on will simply um, uh, continue to exist to explain how things work. Mm -hmm. But it will not be a taxonomic category where we say all these helper viruses are over there. And it's also not possible because, of course, there is no monophily of helper viruses. Right. So, you so there is this word symbiont, which I haven't heard. Uh, if you look at uh, lichen, for instance, which is a fungus and an algae together, uh, neither one can live apart from the other. Uh, maybe you can call them symbiotic viruses. You know, the helper viruses now yeah. are symbiotic well, I, with another I, virus. Right, but the problem is um, the virophages are exactly the opposite. They're not symbiotic. Oh. That's why they're called virophages, because they're right. actually destroying, um, the, so they're <laughs> dependent on the helper virus, but they're right. destroying the replication machinery of the helper virus. Yeah. And so there is an idea right okay. now that organisms might actually strive for infection with the virophage, because the virophage will control the infection with its helper virus. Oh. So Vincent, you just published a new book with four other authors. Yeah, published it's by already, ASM. It's already out of date. Well, wait a minute. I, right, I was going to say, <laughs> when you go to the the first sentence of your book, what does it say? How do you define viruses? Our definition yeah, what is, is not going to be satisfying to everyone here, but it's very simple. A virus is an obligate intracellular parasite composed of a nucleic acid and protein coat and sometimes with a membrane. And that... It doesn't work anymore because the viroids. <laughs> are you guys changing viroids to viruses too, uh, Jens? Well, no, um, not not immediately. So what I did. So I am I am the editor for the virology division news section in Archives of Virology, and so that's called VDN. Um, and VDN is kind of the, the the speaking organ of everything that is falling into taxonomy and so on. And so people publish articles of what's happening in taxonomy. And so I. I asked this question to myself, not to the ICTV, but I was just curious, are viroids viruses or not? And so I um, kind of commissioned a paper by the um, viroid um, study group and asked them that question. Um, why are viroids not viruses? Can you explain this to me? And they published a very nice article um, where they argue that um, based on the particular way of replication of these, uh, of these entities, um, they are not viruses. So there seems to be consensus among the viroid specialists that they're not viruses. But I'm not really sure whether there's consensus among the virologists. That I, don't, the I don't see why they can't be viruses. I mean, a lot of, they don't encode protein. That's, I mean, but that shouldn't matter, right? <laughs> so what you, <laughs> it's liquid too, right? I mean, you have hepatitis D sure. virus, which yeah. is first of all a helper, uh, dependent on a helper virus. You you have to have hepatitis B infection. So uh, that was classified for a very long time, even when helper viruses and all these systems were not classifiable before. So there was a lot of like mess. Um, but hepatitis D virus only encodes one protein. Hmm. So uh, you could so kind of argue well maybe if it loses this protein is it then is it then a viroid 
I, I don't know what the what the delineations are mm-hmm. of these things. But I also don't know anything about viroids, so I probably should not be talking about viroids. <laughs> so there's another problem here that I hate to raise, but uh, a eukaryotic cell that has all of its organelles intact, uh, both plant and animal, have mitochondria and chloroplasts, and they have right. inside of them snippets of, well, genomic sequences that encode for things. Mm-hmm. Are those uh, degenerate viruses or are they degenerate bacteria or are they degenerate anythings? Well, I don't know about that in particular, but of course we have all these endogenous viruses that are being discovered. So for a very long time, this was all retroviruses, right? The entire human genome is full of these endogenous retroviruses. Right. Um, but in, in the recent four or five years, um, a whole bunch of people have discovered non-retroviral endogenous virus-like elements. And they're called EVEs or NERVs. They have a whole bunch of different abbreviations for them. Um, and uh, examples of those are raptoviruses, bornoviruses, filoviruses. They're Ebola virus and Marburg virus-like elements that can be found in shrews and in bats and so on. And uh, so they're usually nuclear proteins, uh, parts of nuclear proteins. And if you do sequence alignments, they fit right into that, into that phylogenetic tree. Um, so now we're talking about, we go back to the T-Rex example, right? So can you classify a virus if you have only a piece, if you're sure that it existed? And obviously it existed because otherwise it would not be there. Sure. Um, and, uh, yeah, and then, then stuff becomes wonderfully messy. So, Jens, can you, I don't think we ever define a species, right? Or you said, let's define Ooh. virus and species. We did virus and we couldn't do very much. What about species? Okay, this is excellent. So, um, I don't think, I don't think there's anybody on the planet who can define what a species is. You're right, you are right. Um, and Not even E.O. Wilson. <laughs> nobody can define that, I think. That's um, and that's simply because you, there, there are tons of different definitions. Um, and and this is this is true for all taxonomic schemes in in the in the biology realm, right? So it's very difficult to define. Too many exceptions, right? And so it, it it goes back to the very old idea of well, a species is um, if it can mate with each other, and, <laughs> right, uh, right, but right. not with the other thing. Yeah, right? that's, that's and then matter. of course that got a little bit messy with uh, the mule and the liger and those right. things. So that then it was extended. Prokaryotes. <laughs> uh, well, yes, but just on the mammal level, it's it, it got very. Oh very yeah, messy. yeah, sure, sure. So. But of course, mammals are not anywhere close to being the most numerous group of animals. Yeah. So the moment you go into the, the, the unicellular realm and stuff, um, right, right. when it comes to sex, everything is off, so that doesn't work. So the, the entire sexual idea doesn't work. Um, so the, the best definition that, I, that I've seen so far, the, the definition that I work by, uh, was actually brought forward by um, by Richard Dawkins um, <laughs> right. in, in one of his books. I'm not really sure which book it was, but... Um, uh, he basically said um, the, a species is pretty much the average of all of its members. Um, so I like that. So, the, and, and so there's a different in virology that's very clear. In, in virology, you have a species name, and the species has a member, and the member is the actual virus. Now, a species is a taxonomic category, the same way as family and order and so on, and those things are not real. Right. Those are ideas, right? right. This is, I, I say this fits into this category. So philosophically distinct. So um, the species human enterovirus C um, is an idea in my head. It does not exist. It's not something that I can grab. So I cannot get infected with the species human enterovirus C, and I cannot eradicate that species. <laughs> that's, why, that's why we still have, and if you think about it, we actually do this in daily life. That's why we have a species Tyrannosaurus rex. Yes. We just don't have its member. Exactly. Member is gone. Exactly. Right? So, so that, that's... That's the idea, that's the, that's the philosophical um, separation between species and viruses. And species names get italicized to denote exactly that, and yeah. virus names do not. Well, the, so, niche, the niche concept comes into it, too, though. You have to say that because it's not just the sum of its members. You have to say where those members actually live. Oh, yes, absolutely. So um, that's really important, I think. Yes, it is really important, but it's also really complicated. Because well, of, course, of course. In the arena viruses, we have this problem that you have viruses that are clearly related to each other, but they're quite distant, but they both infect the multi rat. Right. So the niche is the same, but the virus is yeah. different. So yeah. what is it now? Right? So that is hard. So Is that the loss of virus group? Yes. That's right. It's a, it's That's a right. big mess. Yeah. <laughs> I'm, I'm not happy about it at all. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so Richard Dawkins basically said if you want to understand the difference between this categorization thing and the member thing, you, um, you take all the members of the species that have ever lived 
um, that currently are living and in the future will live, and you take the average, and that's your definition of that particular one species. Yeah, well, you know. And if you combine, if you compare that to another species, then you will see there's a clear difference. However, of course, if you go back in time, <laughs> step by step, they will merge to something exactly, else, right? Exactly. So this is this is a nice example. So I'm going to give you um, a a I sort of um, I'm trying to do this in a non-offensive way because it's really meant non-offensively, but I'm going to give you an example for what that means. Mammals. The, the category mammals is defined as you having human uh, as having fur theoretically and most importantly mammary glands right yep so you you you, you give milk to your young and warm blooded and warm blooded so i'm going to i'm going to focus on the mammary glands does this mean now that somebody who doesn't have mammary glands is not a mammal anymore of course not Right, so right. Yeah, there are different yeah. there are different options. There's, so you can have a mutation and you get born with a with a con, with a disfiguration. Um, you can you could lose your breasts through um, you know cancer things like that. And of course that that doesn't mean at all that you have been like declassified. It's so completely ridiculous. But it's a very drastic example um, uh, to remember what the difference is. Right, a mammal is defined as all of the average of all of these properties that we took. Um, and then you can define what these individual members are. And for virology, this is exactly the same. Um, just because you have a particular mutation somewhere and it knocks out an open reading frame, doesn't mean that this does not belong to the group anymore. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. If, as long as you have still hints that those open reading frames once existed or is still there but not expressed and so on. Now, if the entire open reading frame is gone, yeah. then you need to ask the question, has it been lost and can you prove it in some kind of a way? And then it's getting complicated again. Mm-hmm. But this is what really what a, what a species kind of is. So. A Homo sapiens doesn't visit you tonight. It's a human who comes over, and uh, and you're not going to eat gallus gallus <laughs> tonight, but you're going to eat chicken. So yeah. this, th- there's a philosophical thing that needs to be grasped. Uh, okay. Yeah. So a, a genus is the same thing, right? Right. A genus is the same thing. A family is the same thing, and so on. All yeah. of these things. That's why we write when we write articles. We write in plurals. We say enteroviruses so, do the following thing, and we don't write the geno- genus enterovirus. Yes, uh, right. That's right. right. So there used to be just two kingdoms. And now there are five kingdoms. And that, that happened because of the advent of molecular biology, that you could start to look at things that you didn't even need to know where their niches were. You could just what look the at the sequences dictions? and say, well, you've got prokaryotes, eukaryotes, archaea, uh, vertebrata, and um, what about plants? plants. And then you've got the entire plant kingdom. Yeah. Well, so there's... Well, Margulis wrote the book. I'll have to go back and look at the exact categories, but uh, there used to be just two, and now there are five. I think for a while there were seven. And then, yeah, but then they got amalgamated or something. They got lumped. Lumped. There you go. <laughs> and, uh, and viruses <laughs> ought to be a kingdom. It probably is. Exactly. Yeah. No, that's the last question I would have. What, when I where used would to give you a, brief, a brief rundown of this to science journalism students at NYU, <laughs> I would, you know, I would ask, "How many kingdoms are there?" Right. And of course, you get this whole diversity of answers, and yeah, then, yeah, yeah. then I'd go into the, uh, you know, the woes and archaea and this and that. Yeah, yeah. Um, and then uh, inevitably somebody would ask about viruses, and I would say, yeah. "Oh, they belong up here at the top of the board, <laughs> lording it over all of the other things on right. the board, because um, they could they could infect potentially yeah, anything." Does- there's a beautiful sentence, and I don't know who said it, um, but um, the sentence says, viruses are the mistletoe in the tree of life. Goodness <laughs> gracious. <laughs> I like that. Could be a title. Yes, so I mean, the, five, is, the five kingdoms are plants, animals, fungi, proteists, and monera. Bingo. Yeah, and you're That's missing right. the chromists, a because, I'm fa- because I'm fairly sure the chromists um, are, are a kingdom as well. Yeah. So yeah, so this, I mean, and of course, the moment you learn something new, but the, but the interesting thing is that you have these groups they crystallize over time, right? So yeah. um, there was a long discussion of whether viruses are monophyletic, and I would say there's a pretty good consensus that they're not monophyletic. Mm-hmm. Um, but there's also a pretty good consensus that there are probably only like four or five major groups of viruses that might have evolved independently from each other. And the more viruses we find, the more we can fit them into those four or five groups. Deep. So um, it is it, it, it is both. It is, it is chaotic and getting more ordered. You know this the idea of uh, Dennis Bamford who thinks that Capsid structure can unify taxonomy. Of course, that doesn't hold for viruses that don't have capsids. But <laughs> he says you can take 87 families and 20 different DNA virus families fall into five distinct structural groups. Yeah, but exactly like you said, right? I mean, there's uh, there's a whole bunch of, of critters that don't yeah, do that yeah. kind of stuff. Yeah. I'm just trying, because you said you're going to teach about um, uh, you're going to teach about fungi, right? 
Yeah. So, um, <laughs> so viruses that do not um, make variants, uh, variants in capsids and all this other stuff, they fall all into your little fungus kingdom. Yeah, they don't make so, capsids, right? They stay right. inside. So yeah. What's yeah. the farthest back in paleo samples that you can go and find a genuine viral sequence? 100, well, 100, 200 million years. You can see them in the genomes of animals, right? All those yes. integrated viral sequences you no, just I mean, recovered about. from a sample and sequenced. 30,000 years old, I think. Is, is the that oldest. the oldest one so far? Yeah, the ones from the Siberian ice, right, Jens? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I would say that's right. But um, for my, um, on a, a hints of viruses, that's exactly what Vincent said. I mean, you look at the retroviral elements and so on, you go back. Like, if you look at the filoviruses, like Ebola, um, I think the phylogenetic tree right now is that these viruses are about 18 million years old. Huh. Um, and that's simply based on finding filovirus elements in genomes of different mammals, and then you overlay the mammals on the mammal phylogenetic tree, and then you can pretty much deduce of uh, it has to have had been in this rat and this yeah. rat and this ancestor and so on. Do we do we have any Neanderthal-specific retroviral sequences? That's another question for Wilkin. <laughs> okay. <laughs> you know, I have to mention this. I got an email, <clears throat> not to Twiv, but to me, and this is relevant. It's entitled "It Seems You Ask Me to Believe." And this fellow wrote, regarding, um, he was writing about a blog post where uh, it talked about the wasp viruses. Mm -hmm. Regarding your blog requires me to believe or seems to make me take a leap of faith in something that was supposed to have happened a hundred million years ago. <laughs> Can't science be a little less subjective and limit the experiment <laughs> to what happens in the lab over the time limit of the experiment? No. Nope. It seems that your presuppositions are significantly different than mine, and that difference would affect the outcome of the conclusions. I'm interested in your virology course, but I'm concerned that we would have vastly different presuppositions, which would affect our understanding, of, for instance, the evolution, which he has in quotes, of viruses. So this is a creationist. It's very interesting, isn't it? I can't deal with a hundred million year old thing. Right. Mm. I mean, it's not subjective. It's that in order for... Uh, this whole body of knowledge that we have to be consistent, you have to, you, there are some things that you can infer about what must have happened 100 million yeah, years exactly. ago. You have to bend the laws of physics in order to get any other result from the observed data. Yeah. No, in this I, think, case, I think that's the key, too. I mean, the key is simply what's, your, what's the better explanation? Right. And, then, and of course, not an explanation of like somebody made it. Yeah, right. um, yeah. I mean, we're lucky that bones last almost forever, and right. uh, that uh, hominid that you were referring to before, it is homo because of this little piece of bone that they found around the orbital. And, and but, the moment uh, they saw that and it went into place, they said, that's a homo. Dixon, correct me if I'm wrong. Mm -hmm. For the dinosaur, they're not actually bones anymore. They're fossilized. But yes. the, right? the, yeah, but so the, the actual bone is gone. They are but, they are, but they are distinguistable as bones. Yeah, they are, they are, been bones. They're like casts that's in a way. Correct. Right? That's exactly right. Now, this, this new... Uh, Hominid. Hominid? A homo it, was naledi. It, a, I said it wrong before. Was it really a bone or yeah, was bone. it a fossil? Yeah, a bone. was an actual bone. Because those, that that those are younger those than dinosaurs, obviously. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Wow, that's cool. This is good discussion. Absolutely. Is there anything else we need to cover <laughs> that we didn't? Uh, yeah, I, I want to um, ask uh, Jens. I, um, Do we have to listen to the ICTV? <laughs> <laughs> in uh, in a, uh, an ordinary phylogenetic uh, tree, there's a they kind of go to a trunk, mm -hmm. okay? Mm -hmm. So there's... Uh, everything on a given tree evolved from some single ancestral thing. Yeah, that's no, I don't pretty like iffy. Where this is going. That's pretty iffy. <laughs> so, um, yeah, maybe that's generally not true. No, but I'm not. asking specifically in the case of viruses, what's your perspective on that? Hmm. Uh, oh. Is there is there a uh, a primordial ancestral virus or did replicating entities evolve in a few different forms. Even I think, a capsid. Yeah. I think, right. uh, I think uh, Eugene has this all happening in the primordial soup. Yeah, so I, I would be a fool to argue with Eugene. So uh, <laughs> 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 I, I'm not going to go there. But um, uh, I, I think I mean, what we see is what, what I just said before. Right? We see a few major groups um, and with very fundamental uh, differences. And so... Um, since we are talking about Eugene, let me see, I have a, that's this wonderful little table here, right? So um, there are individual groups that um, 
have particular replication machineries um, that you don't find anywhere else. So it's it's not only like you know one protein that does something, but you need to have an entire barrage of uh, proteins that interact with each other to do something very specific. Um, and so I would say yes, if you take these groups um, and and you can reduce them in some kind of a way, maybe by finding fossils and so on, and or like artificial systems in the laboratory. I think you will be able to go back and find an ancestral virus of that group. That said, though, I don't think um, I, I don't think we will end up with one group in the end. I think right. we will end up with five or six major virus groups that have somehow independently evolved, yes. and probably hundreds, if not thousands, of these groups that have evolved in the beginning and got eradicated very quickly, and we have no mm. way of knowing that anymore. So, because of course we see the winners of evolution here, right? So, these all of these these groups have made it somehow. So there are these. Um, okay, that makes sense to me. So I think that there, there like the viroids and um, uh, there, there are some organisms that are all they all have the same um, uh, rolling circle replication, for example. You don't find this anywhere else. Like things like this, um, they, they, you might be able to group things ultimately with that. All right. Anything else before we move on? What's I a TSA virus? Ah, <laughs> uh, what, what'd you say, Cavi? What's a TSA virus? It was in oh. Jens's letter. Yeah, no, this uh, t- a transcriptional shotgun assembly. Ah. Um, so ah, you know, okay. if you if you go now, if um, people like you know Ian and others who discover new viruses, they they are um, kind of blasting them against everything that is in the databases, and we have more and more um, uh, vi- uh, genomes of hosts, uh, mammals, and everything else, and we have more and more transcriptons in the databases. And so what happens a lot lately is that. A, a, a viral sequence will pop up in a transcriptional shotgun assembly that is clearly related to whatever that new virus is. And so the question is now, well, is it classifiable or not? Um, because again, you don't, a transcriptional shotgun assembly is not really, do you have, is, is this a niche? Or is it just a sequence? Uh, but what do you do if it clearly if it clearly clusters with something? And so in the Mononega viralis um, uh, order, there are a bunch of viruses that are a little bit obscure, like the Sigma viruses that infect Rosophila, and uh, and, there's, uh, and there's one of those TSAs that comes from Hydra. Um, and that, of course, is significant from an evolutionary point of view. If you say mononega viruses are not only like in higher vertebrates and fungus, but they're also like in Hydra and other things. And um, But I don't think there's any consensus right now in, uh, among the virologists, and especially among the taxon- taxonomists, whether these things are classifiable or not, or whether you have to fish for them and find them and one of the things that amuses, if not fascinates me, uh, Jens, is that a taxonomy, superficially, if you just, you know, say you're going to talk about taxonomy, 90% of the audience is going to keel over snoring, right? <laughs> right. Um, when, when you get into it. Oh, no, it's fascinating. Wind, it's so fascinating because it you is. wind up talking about, you having these philosophical discussions right. about the ultimate nature of these things. <laughs> and so right. that's, why, that's why I wanted to do this. So because, right. I, I, of right. course, I get yeah. asked on a daily basis, whoa, why are you interested in this stuff? <laughs> yeah. Right? Yeah. And, and I am fundamentally interested because I love viruses. And viruses without taxonomy is completely useless. Right. The, uh, the entire idea of where they come from and how they work, everything is tied together. And ultimately, taxonomy is a way of, of um, making a picture of this. And, and yeah, and it's, and it's so nice because it's such a broad viewpoint on the whole thing. Yeah, very, right. very cool. In fact, this discussion has made me want to join the ICTV. <laughs> well, well, come on enough to do, Vincent? And, I'm and, sure they'll, uh, fact, they'd, they'd like to have you aboard. Do you actually have physical meetings or it's all online? Uh, we have physical meetings once a year, uh, the executive committee. Um, so we just had the annual meeting in July for this year. Um, there will be more meetings in the future because we get funding. Um, and so we will have a first meeting um, ever, I think, in the history of the ICTV in early spring 2016, where all the chairs of the individual study groups are invited to attend. Hmm. Um, and that is important because the, the chairs of the study groups, um, are they're not taxonomists necessarily, right? I mean, often they're simply like an eminent person in the field. So, I mean, if you want to talk poliovirus and stuff, it's it, it's not unlikely that somebody comes to you, Vincent, I mean, uh, and says like, you know, you, you know a lot about polio and so like, um, don't you want to be the chair of this? And then you say, well, it, depending on how old you are and how, how situated you are, you might say, oh, this looks good on my CV. Sure, I'm going to take this. Um, and, then you, and then you're the chair of a study group. Now, um, and then, and then you start discussing and whatnot. And so many people who are in study groups have not necessarily incorporated um, the, the, the code for, uh, for classification in, in their minds yet. They have not gone over all of these issues. They know their viruses very well. 
And so it is very important that we get the individual virologists with the individual taxonomists into one room so that both can voice their frustrations and also their admirations in, in, uh, in, in both directions so we understand each other a little bit better. Um, and that, that's why I wanted to do this TWIF because maybe um, uh, people understand a little bit why this is complicated and also why decisions are being made that not necessarily everybody agrees on, that this is a democratic process with voting and consensus. Um, and there are many decisions that the ICTV has voted on that I personally don't agree with and vice versa some things that I have argued vehemently for and people have said, are you nuts? Right? And so ultimately all of this is it's a process and it's a process that will continue until we have covered the sequence space of viruses, which is not going to happen in our lifetime. Yeah, I would say the only I like a lot of the things I heard today. I really, really like the only suggestion I would make to the ICTV is just try and make it a little quicker than six months. Yes. I think virology is really changing much more rapidly, and it needs to ICTV needs to accommodate that for sure. You know? Yeah, there there are ways theoretically of doing this. So, so there are there are journals out there for botany and zoology. Um, that basically ask an, an article to be submitted and the article itself counts as a proposal and the way how this is done is that there's a template that is it's a program template for your article and everything you put into the template automatically um, ends up in databases automatically gets aligned with things and so on so theoretically the entire proposal process could be kind of automated and put on the author who wants to right. get his virus accomplished so right. there's a group out there that wants to Write a barcode for every species on the planet. Yeah, there's. <laughs> I've, I've reviewed a few interesting papers that are actually they're, they're cool. They're um, they're based on mathematical procedures where you take the entire genome yep. and you run it against all the other genomes, um, right. and then you can uh, assign a particular code to this particular genome. Exactly. It's usually like you know ten numbers or whatever. Yeah, yeah. Um, that is very good for a purely classification purpose. And so that could be a number in a GenBank entry. Exactly. My only request would be that there should be some kind of a, um, uh, a name that is also yes, associated then with this particular number so we can actually of talk course. to each other. Of course. All right. Last call. It's fabulous. All right. Mm -hmm. Let's do some picks. Okay. Are you going to skip Amy's letter? Yeah, I didn't. I could do it. Um, I'm not sure. I don't think we have any answers for her. Yeah, I, don't, sure. I, I don't think we have answers. That's <laughs> Basically, she wanted to know the exact definitions of virus strains, isolates, variants, genogroups, genotypes, types, subtypes, and quasi-species. <laughs> oh, I like it, though. I like it. Just briefly. Yeah, go ahead. Go for it. Yeah, okay, this wasn't so. the, this wasn't in on the version that I sent you because it just came on this morning, I think. so. But you heard the question, right? Yeah, I mean, there was, there was a question here on your, in the file that you sent out for preparing for this. And uh, the last point for me was here, go over the Ebola virus nomenclature. Right. Um, and so I, I kind of keep this in mind here. So, yes, the biggest problem is there are no definitions for all of these things, like at all. Mm. So, um, so everybody uses whatever they please. Um, and, uh, and that, of course, is a problem because I'm, I'm honestly not really sure what a genotype is. Um, if you have something that genomically is really different from something else, then it's a different virus. Um, and uh, if it's like minorly different, then we have a different isolate of the same virus. So I don't really know what, when you would need the genotype. Um, but many of these individual words um, uh, come from the current um, problem in virus taxonomy that we do not have the necessary flexibility on the rank tree um, to adequately reflect our phylogenetic trees. So what I mean with this is if you have, a, if you have an isolate tree and you have um, seven distinct branch levels, but you only have five categories, order, family, subfamily, whatever, then you can't fit these two. And so people came up with individual words for um, fitting these things somehow in, but saying they're still nevertheless different. And so you will find people who write articles and suddenly talk about subspecies um, of viruses, although of course there is no subspecies category. And basically what they say is like, this belongs to the species based on the following definitions, but it's clearly different from these other things. Um, and so in phylovirology, um, one of the, we have one of those examples. We have a, a species called Marburg-Marburg virus, and it has two members. And these two members, one of them is called Marburg virus, and the other one is called Raven virus. And so the question is, why was this done? Well, ultimately, the original phylogeny was all based on Ebola viruses, and people came up with a sequence cutoff and said, well, if the virus is, I think it's 40% different from the prototype Ebola virus from Zaire, then we call it something different and it became Sudan virus and Western virus and so on. And then they looked at Marburg viruses and they have this entire cluster of Marburg virus, well, let's call them isolates for now, and they all cluster together within like a 5% margin. And then you have this other virus 
which is clearly also a Marburg virus, but it's 27% different from this other group. But it's 27%, not 40%. So the group ultimately decided that they're not comfortable with making this a completely new species because it's not like the Ebola virus with 40% and so dramatically different. Although, of course, I'm not really sure whether you can even compare the evolution of Marburg virus and Ebola viruses in the first place in terms of speed. Um, and so therefore, they, they assigned it as a, as a separate virus in the same species. Um, and of course, you can play the same game then with individual viruses. You can take your polio virus clade and you can take all the isolates and make a tree and there will be one that is sticking out or one that causes not polio but causes, I don't know, something different. Uh, um, and then you can say, well, this is, this is different. We need to somehow like, accommodate this. And so we're going to call this a strain genotype and so on. So in the filovirus group, we have actually attempted to define all of these things. Hmm. So we have, we have said, okay, we're we going to delete genotypes and serotypes and all this other stuff. We're not going to talk about this at all anymore. And we're only going to focus on, as members of the species, as viruses, uh, strains, variants, and isolates. These are the only terms that, uh, that we should refer to. Um, and we defined a strain um, as something that is phenotypically different from your prototype. And with phenotypically different, uh, we mean um, causes a different disease. Right. So if you would have an Ebola virus, mm. it suddenly does not cause a viral hemorrhagic fever, but it causes massive diarrhea or something like this, um, then this could be a strain, even though the genome could be you know, 99% identical to the, to the original virus. And there are examples for this. If you go into Flavi uh, viruses, um, there are tick-borne tick -borne encephalitis viruses. You need one mutation, I think, in, in the amino acid sequence of some protein, and you switch from an encephalitic virus to a viral hemorrhagic fever virus. So these, in field virology, we, we would call strains. We don't know an example of this in the natural world, so we refrain, or should refrain, from the word strain. Hmm. Um, there are laboratory strains. So if you put a wild-type Ebola virus into a, a regular mouse, a regular laboratory mouse, it doesn't cause disease. So that's the natural state, right? It doesn't cause disease. But if you serial passage it, it will call it, cause disease and it will have a model of infection. So at that very moment, when you cause a disease, you have, you have a different phenotype of the natural route, and then we call these strains. I wish we could go to jail for a gain of consciousness. I was just going to yeah. say, it's a shame oh, we can't do that experiment. Oh, don't, I, I will not even <laughs> utter a word about this. <laughs> <laughs> so wasn't the SARS virus isolated from the human outbreak in China like 30% different than the nearest coronavirus that they could find in the local environment? So but they didn't the time, even know where it came from. At the time, but now they're Now they've, they've pinned it down? Yeah. Yeah. And so, so ultimately, for me, this is kind of a clustering thing. And so if you, um, if you go to the next step and the variants and stuff that's uh, kind of dear to my heart when it comes to Ebola virus. Um, if you take all these sequences we have from the Western African outbreak right now, and I think we're up to like 1,200 or so, mm. and, you, and you all align them with each other, every single sequence is going to be a little bit different than the other, right? You always have one mutation, two mutations, six mm -hmm. mutations, yeah. over the 18,000 um, uh, genome, uh, nucleotide genome. But all of these viruses are more closely related to each other um, then to Anything all of different, else, yeah. then to all the other isolates of Ebola virus that we have from 1995 and so on, and so we basically said we're going to call this entire cluster of viruses that goes back to one introduction in Western Africa a variant, mm. so which we call Macona, and so we now have uh, 1,000 sequences and let's say 20 isolates of Macona, and th so there might be a Macona uh, Macona CO5 isolate comes from Guinea and Macona something, something isolate comes from Liberia and so on. So they are, and the Macona clusters them together as, as the variant, and the isolate designations say they are different from each other. But if you, like, if you take Macona and you compare it to what we now call Kikwit, that was 1995, um, both of these groups are very separate. And of course, within Kikwit, you again have 60 different isolates that are more closely related to each other. Um, I'm not really sure whether this is um, in any kind of way expandable or transferable to other virus groups. There hasn't so, been so you could have a number of different strains within a variant? Yes. Okay. But the converse is not true. So there's a kind of a hierarchy to this. Correct. Okay. okay. Yeah, I think, you know, other virus, other, other uh, groups of virologists for their favorite virus have tried to do uh, similar sorts of things, and that is to come up with some sort of scheme with a nomenclature associated with it to deal with all of the variation uh, that, that happens within their group. But uh, they will have their own scheme and their own names, okay? So, so and, and 
these groups aren't necessarily talking to each other. Okay, no, so there's no other. sort of uniform system for this. Right. So this and this is also it's an important thing for people to remember. The ICTV is not responsible for viruses. It's responsible for taxa. So they, they deal with species and families and so on. But there is no entity that says viruses need to be named in any particular way. Mm -hmm. um, if I can, I can publish an article tomorrow and call polio virus grapefruit virus if I want, um, that, that ICTV will not get angry at me for doing this. Now, the polio virologists will not be happy Vincent with it. Vincent won't speak then, to you again. That's right. And then we'll probably not get through with it on peer review and so on. But there's no, there, there's no entity that says you shouldn't be doing this, which is a big, um, uh, it's a gap in virology. Um, the same thing with abbreviations and so on, and then all the way down to like strain and variants and so, so on. So a lot of cities don't want their names associated with where those viruses came from. So I think Nor Norwalk virus changed to norovirus. As the result of some stigmata associated with the yeah, fact. Yeah, what state was that? Dixon? That was um, Ohio. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, yeah, that's, so that changed in overnight, I thought. Yeah, there has also been the WHO effort. I don't know if you've seen this. There was a recommendation from WHO on how to name viruses in the future to avoid all the potential uh, pitfalls and whatnot. And right. Um, I, I, I am shocked by this proposal simply because it's unworkable. Um, it's just a political thing, right? Yeah, but the virus names will not mean anything anymore. And yeah, we have exactly. virus names that I find absolutely terrible because nobody will ever use them in their right mind, right? I, so, I love some leaky forest virus. That's one of my yes. all-time favorites. Yeah, oh, yeah. My, mine is Onyong Yong. On Yong Yong. Oh, that's yeah. a great one. <laughs> Chicken Gunya, I like that one because that's yes. what we had for dinner last night. Yeah, Yen, <laughs> so you said for the filoviruses, you've defined strains and variants. Was there one other? Oh, the isolates, which are simply the instances of everything that you that you so, get. So, so in the twelve hundred sequences that you mentioned from the West Africa, each of those twelve hundred is an isolate. Uh, for classification purposes in GenBank, yes. Okay. So uh, this is so. There's another complexity to all of this, of course, because in order to deal with taxonomy, we have to work with databases, and uh, and databases have been programmed in a particular way, right? So GenBank has an isolate field and a strain field and so on. Mm -hmm. And unfortunately, those are not, of course, the same way defined how other people define these things. So when we put a sequence in that you find in a, in a, a P0 sequence from, let's say, a serum sample from a person uh, with Ebola virus infection, and you have a full genome, you have full coverage and so on, um, then this needs to go in GenBank and you need to give it an isolate name. But that does not imply that you actually have a replicating isolate. And many mm -hmm. virologists mm -hmm. um, will think if you say isolate that something has been isolated. Um, so I look at this from a, like, um, I use the word isolated in a very loose form as um, uh, the presence has been proven. Okay. So that's, that's your filovirus definition. Yeah, and it's simply been done because um, I think somebody needs to slowly start looking into these things. Yeah. And there, there are a few groups who are um, the rotavirus group, the adenovirus group. There are, there are a few groups that are kind of proactive trying to come to grips with these things. And so when we started to come up with, like, how to name um, filovirus isolates in their entirety um, for GenBank entries and so on. We tried to model it according to the rotavirus suggestions and a little bit according to the flu virus suggestions where we would put like, you know, um, uh, years and uh, places of isolation and so on all together um, with the hope that um, other groups will start to latch on, do similar things, and we'll figure out what is workable over all the virus groups and what is not. And that's actually what is happening in NCBI especially, in, and Rodney Bristow and his group are very, very active trying to engage different virology groups to see where are the individual pitfalls with, with naming and database annotation and database uh, deposition and so on with their particular virus group. Okay. All right. Can we do picks now? Yes. Mm -hmm. All right. Alan, what do you have? I have, I'm not actually on Instagram, but um, this page is on Instagram and you can just look at it there. Without it, without being on the surface, mm. um, yeah, cool. <laughs> it, it's called the Jefferson Grid, and mm. the the name of this um, little visual blog uh, derives from Thomas Jefferson proposing initially that um, uh, this vast territory out to the west, by which he meant like Pennsylvania, um, <laughs> be surveyed and and marked off in square mile squares, mm. um, and then everything could be administered and farmers could be uh, could deeded land within those square mile plots. And this structure actually still undergirds a lot of our nation's infrastructure. 
Um, so that is, in fact, what's been done. And, and if you look at topographic maps or what have you, you have these square mile grids. So what this person is doing, um, and I, th it's, I think it's anonymous, I don't know who's behind this, but this person either takes submissions from people or maybe manually goes through themselves and looks at Google Earth, which has, of course, aerial imagery of pretty much the whole planet, and picks out interesting-looking square miles. <laughs> These are you really can cool. See some yeah, they of them are cool. Like abstract just, paintings. The patterns that emerge in or these Amish these quilts. grids, and and I think these are mostly from the United States, or all from the United States. Um, as I say, we've we've built our nation around these square grids, and you can see them cropping up in in all these various settings. They're so mm -hmm. cool. Yeah, yeah, very cool. Yeah. Neat. All right, thank you for that. That's very nice. Sure. Rich Condit, what do you have? So my pick is a New York Times series that uh, happened this summer called Summer of Science. Right. And uh, it's just a, a series that they ran during the summer and published little snippets, really, every couple of days that are nice little uh, pieces from all over thing? science, structured for the uh, lay person. I just thought they'd really done a really nice job, and I want to have people have a chance to look through them. Oh, neat. Well, that's it. Dixon, that's a deep sea worm. A worm. Eight inches long. Wow. Oh, and I actually just realized that the Jefferson grid was um, one of the things on this New York Times Summer of Science. Really? Oh, oh. cool. Mm, cool. How about that? Very circular. Yep. I actually, I actually wrote the authors of this and said, well done. You know, keep it up. They appreciated that. That was good. Cool. Kathy, what do you have for us? I picked Bill Nye, the science guy, dancing the click. <laughs> so mostly, <laughs> it's just fun. It's not that science-related, except it's Bill Nye, the science guy, who may not be known to people outside the United States, but he's, according to Wikipedia, a science educator, comedian, television host, actor, writer, scientist, and former mechanical engineer. And I would add, great dancer. <laughs> so uh, just check out this. The, the link is to... A longer video, but uh, he's just the first I'll two minutes, 43 it. seconds. I'll do it. Very good. Thank you. Dixon? Well, I'm going to pick an opening uh, this Friday <coughs> called The Martian. It's a movie, also a book. Uh, Matt Damon is starring in this movie called The Martian. And um, I picked it without ever having read the book and without ever read uh, seen the movie because it just came out. But it has as its basis the explanation of how you grow food in controlled environments. Mm -hmm. So CEA, Controlled Environment Agriculture, ah. saves his life. And mm -hmm. that's the basis for, of course, going forward with uh, vertical farming. And if you want to live on Mars, you have to do it here first. That's why I wanted you to read it. Oh, well. And you told me to go to hell. I did not. Like three months ago, I you said, not. no, I'm not reading that. You should I did be not. nicer to Vince. I never, you know. You should be nicer to me. <laughs> Dixon, you should read the book. It's I've, fabulous. I've got the book. Uh, actually, Steve gave it to me, and I've got it at home, and I'm going to do that over the weekend. And Jens, your pick was How I Killed Pluto. <laughs> I have three picks. Okay, so, go yes. ahead. My, my first pick was How I Killed Pluto and Why It Had It Coming, because it's just a fun book to read, um, especially because of like all the hate that the poor guy got for doing this. <laughs> so, um, my second pick is, I don't know, maybe you have had this before on the show. Um, it's called Live in Our Phage World. Um, by Forrest Rower and Mary Yule and a few others, and it's freely available on the net. Mm -hmm. um, it is a beautiful illustrated book. So I don't I've know. seen that book. Yeah, yes, you have it, that. don't you, Dixon? I, I I go to bed with it every night. No, I, Goff gave you his. <laughs> yeah, he copy, did. Right? He did. He did. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, this is absolutely gorgeous. It's gorgeous. So it is fantastic. Simply because the illustrations are not your typical run of the mill. Right. Yeah, they're That's beautiful. Right. That's illustrations. Right. Nice. That's right. And so I don't know anything about phages, so I can't really vouch for like how <laughs> everything is and stuff, but it's just beautiful to look at. And my third pick is, since you guys are more and more moving away from virology and coming up with all different crazy science stuff, <laughs> um, I, I don't know if you had discussed this article in Science a while back. It was, I think, in July and called Why the Seahorse Tail is Square. Um, <laughs> but this is a fantastic oh. article of applied science on how you can use 3D printing, making your own seahorse tail, smashing them, and then by that decide why the seahorse tail is square. Oh, cool. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. That's fabulous. Um, Life in our phage world. So Forrest Rower sent me a copy, which is very nice. I didn't ask, and he just sent it, and he wrote on the inside cover, uh, hope you enjoy the book. Love the show, Forrest. Nice. Cool. Meaning nice. twiv. Mm -hmm. Should have him on. 
Uh, hey, Dixon, I was yes. uh, uh, off the air when you picked The Martian. Have you seen it? Not yet. It just opened today. No, he hasn't read it. He hasn't seen it, but he's picking it. But I know. Oh, the reason why I picked it, Richard, I said that. is... He's is, breaking the rules, but I'm going to be nice to him. It's because it okay. features controlled environment agriculture. How do you know? Uh, if okay. you didn't see it or read it. I've seen, uh, the, he's I've read seen about the, it. Uh, the previews. So, guys, this is what bugs me. Three <laughs> months ago, you know, I read this, and I said, Dixon would love this. It's indoor agriculture. Uh-huh. And I said, you should read this. And he just waved me away. He's like, not. dissed me. He dissed me. No, I didn't. Yeah, you did. No, I didn't. Let's it's stay fun. nice. Let's stay nice. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I'm way you, too you sensitive. You should really go to counseling. <laughs> Thank you, Jens. <laughs> <laughs> we right. should go to counseling? <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> <laughs> it's all his fault. <laughs> uh, yeah. So, do you? Th- can we let him pick something he's neither seen nor read? Sure. Of course you can. Well, okay. he just did. All right. All right. Let me. Th- my pick is very quick. It is a publication uh, by the National Academy of Sciences of a workshop they ran not too long ago. Does the public trust science? There are. It was a conference. Basically, there are videos online. There is also a publication which you can download for free. And it's all about this issue, you know, does the public trust science? Yes, no, why don't they, why do they, and how can we fix it? It's a kind of a cool meeting. So check that out. We do not have a listener pick this week. How about that? First time in a long time, but that's okay. Uh, You guys can just crank it up and get back to it. Uh, This is TWIV. You can find it at twiv.tv and on iTunes. You can find it on your Android or iOS device. They have lots of podcatching apps on those, and it's all free. And, and we'd love to get your questions and comments. Send them to twiv at twiv.tv. Our guest today has been Jens Kuhn from the NIH. Jens, this is great. Thanks a lot. I hope you enjoyed it. It was a lot of fun. And I think we really covered the whole area of taxonomy, all the issues, and I uh, hope people enjoy this. And I hope the ICTV a, enjoyed it. It was fun. Yeah. I think we may have a new record for a twiv length. Yes. <laughs> Two, yeah, uh, yeah, it's pretty long. Oh well, but you're gonna have to go. It's on okay. A long it was run. great. It was great. Yeah, it's no problem. The one with uh, Eugene was long too, Rich. Remember? Oh yeah. Dixon de Pommier is at verticalfarm.com. Thank you, Dixon. You're welcome, Vincent. Kathy Spindler is at the University of Michigan in Ann Arbor. Thank you, Kathy. Thanks. This was a lot of fun. And Rich Condit. He's at the University of Florida in Gainesville. Thank you, Rich. Thanks very much. Always a good time. You you like taxonomy. You wrote the te- you wrote the chapter in Fields Virology, which includes uh, it, right? Uh, yeah, uh, that was an assignment that I got many years ago, <laughs> and I didn't know, have the slightest idea what it was about. It was like the uh, it was like doing a you know a a college. Um, uh, term thesis paper. Paper. or something, yeah, a term that's paper, right. that's right. Um, that's right. And uh, I must say that uh, although that chapter gives some of the rudiments, uh, I it needs, having listened to today's discussion, <laughs> it needs to be uh, totally rewritten, and I know by whom. <laughs> Mm-hmm. <laughs> that's right it actually is a great idea and they're thinking about the next edition so that's right, that's right. right. Dave that's actually right. I, got, got an email. I got uh i got david's email here in my inbox about you know looking at ideas for the next edition yeah it's a good idea i would right. do that i would i second that alan dove is at turbidplaque.com you can find him on twitter thank you alan thank you it's always a pleasure and I am Vincent Racaniello. You can find me at virology.ws. You've been listening to This Week in Virology. Thanks for joining us. We'll be back next week. Another TWIV is viral. <laughs>